Section 1 of Willemville Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne. Willemville Stories by Stephen Crane. The Angel Child. Although Willemville was in no sense a summer resort, the advent of the warm season meant much to it, for then came visitors from the city, people of considerable confidence alighting upon their country cousins. Moreover, many citizens who could afford to do so escaped at this time to the seaside. The town, with the commercial life quite taken out of it, drawled and drowsed through long months, during which nothing was worse than the white dust which arose from every vehicle at blinding noon, and nothing was finer than the cool sheen of the hose sprays over the cropped lawns under the maples in the twilight. One summer the Trescotts had a visitation. Mrs. Trescott owned a cousin who was a painter of high degree. It had almost said that he was of national reputation, but, come to think of it, it is better to say that almost everybody in the United States who knew about art and his travail knew about him. He had picked out a wife, and naturally looking at him, one wondered how he had done it. She was quick, beautiful, imperious, while he was quiet, slow, and misty. She was a veritable queen of health, while he, apparently, was of the most brittle constitution. When he played tennis, particularly, he looked every minute as if he were going to break. They lived in New York in awesome apartments where Japan and Persia, and indeed all the world, confounded the observer. At the end was a cathedral-like studio. They had one child. Perhaps it would be better to say that they had one child. It was a girl. When she came to Willemville with her parents, it was patent that she had an inexhaustible store of white frocks, and that her voice was high and commanding. These things the town knew quickly. Other things it was doomed to discover by a process. Her effect upon the children of the Trescott neighborhood was singular. They at first feared, then admired, then embraced. In two days she was a begum. All day long her voice could be heard directing, drilling, and compelling these freeborn children, and to say that they felt oppression would be wrong for they really fought for records of loyal obedience. All went well until one day was her birthday. On the morning of this day, she walked out into the Trescott garden and said to her father confidently, Papa, give me some money because this is my birthday. He looked dreamily up from his easel. Your birthday, he murmured. Her envisioned father was never energetic enough to be irate unless someone broke through into that place where he lived with the desires of his life. But neither wife nor child ever heeded or even understood the temperamental values, and so some part of him had grown hardened to their inroads. Money, he said. Here, he handed her a five-dollar bill. It was that he did not at all understand the nature of a five-dollar bill. He was deaf to it. He had it. He gave it. That was all. She sallied forth to awaiting people. Jimmy Trescott, Dan Earl, Ella Earl, the Margate twins, the three Phelps children, and others. I've got some pennies now, she cried, waving the bill, and I'm going to buy some candy. They were deeply stirred by this announcement. Most children are penniless 300 days in the year, and to another possessing five pennies, they pay deference. To little Cora, waving a bright green note, these children paid heathenish homage. In some disorder, they thronged after her to a small shop on Bridge Street Hill. First of all came ice cream. Seated in the comic little back parlor, they clamored shrilly over plates of various flavors, and the shopkeeper marveled that cream could vanish so quickly down throats that seemed wide open always for the making of excited screams. These children represented the families of most excellent people. They were all born in whatever purple there was to be had in the vicinity of Williamville. The Margate twins, for example, were out-and-out -out prize winners. With their long golden curls and their countenances of similar vacuity, 
they shone upon the front bench of all Sunday functions, hand in hand, while their uplifted mother felt about her the envy of a hundred other parents, and less heavenly children scoffed from near the door. Then there was little Dan Earl, probably the nicest boy in the world, gentle, fine-grained, obedient to the point where he obeyed anybody. Jimmy Trescott himself was, indeed, the only child who was at all versed in villainy, but in these particular days he was on his very good behavior. As a matter of fact, he was in love. The beauty of his regal little cousin had stolen his manly heart. Yes, they were all most excellent children, but loosened upon this candy shop with five dollars they resembled, in a tiny way, drunken, reveling soldiers within the walls of a stormed city. Upon the heels of ice cream and cake came chocolate mice, butterscotch, everlastings, chocolate cigars, taffy on a stick, taffy on a slate pencil, and many semi-transparent devices resembling lions, tigers, elephants, horses, cats, dogs, cows, sheep, tables, chairs, engines, both railway and for the fighting of fire, soldiers, fine ladies, odd-looking men, clocks, watches, revolvers, rabbits, and bedsteads. A cent was the price of a single wonder. Some of the children, going quite daft, soon had thought to make fight over the spoils, but their queen ruled with an iron grip. Her first inspiration was to satisfy her own fancies, but as soon as that was done, she mingled prodigality with a fine justice, dividing, balancing, bestowing, and sometimes taking away from somebody even that which he had. It was an orgy. In thirty-five minutes, those respectable children looked as if they had been dragged at the tail of a chariot. The sacred Margate twins, blinking and grunting, wishing to take seat upon the floor, and even the most durable Jimmy Trescott found occasion to lean against the counter, wearing at the time a solemn and abstracted air, as if he expected something to happen to him shortly. Of course, their belief had been in an unlimited capacity, but they found there was an end. The shopkeeper handed the queen her change. 273 from 5 leaves 277, Miss Cora, he said, looking upon her with admiration. She turned swiftly to her clan. Oh, oh, she cried in amazement. Look how much I have left. They gazed at the coins in her palm. They knew then that it was not their capacities which were endless. It was the five dollars. The queen led the way to the street. We must think up some way of spending more money, she said, frowning. They stood in silence, awaiting her further speech. Suddenly, she clapped her hands and screamed with delight. Come on, she cried. I know what let's do. Now, behold, she had discovered the red and white pole in front of one shop of William Melche, a barber by trade. It becomes necessary to say a few words conceiving Melche. He was new to the town. He had come and opened a dusty little shop on dusty Bridge Street Hill, and although the neighborhood knew from the courier winds that his diet was mainly cabbage, they were satisfied with that meager data. Of course, Reif Snyder came in to investigate him for local barbers' union, but he found in him only sweetness and light, with a willingness to charge any price at all for a shave or a haircut. In fact, the advent of Nelche would have made barely a ripple upon the placid bosom of Willemville if it were not that his name was Nelche. At first, the people looked at his signboard out of the eye corner and wondered lazily why anyone should bear the name of Nelche. But as time went on, men spoke to other men, saying, How do you pronounce the name of that barber up there on Bridge Street Hill? And then, before any could prevent it, the best minds of the town were splintering their lances against William Nelche's signboard. If a man had a mental superior, he guided him seductively to this name, and washed with glee his wrecking. The clergy of the town even entered the lists. There was one among them who had taken the collegiate prize in Syriac, as well as in several less opaque languages, and the other clergymen, at one of their weekly meetings, sought to betray him into this ambush. 
he pronounced the name correctly but that mattered little since none of them knew whether he did or did not and so they took triumph according to their ignorance under these arduous circumstances it was certain that the town should look for a nickname and at this time the nickname was in process of formation so william Nelche lived on with his secret smiling foolishly towards the world come on cried little cora let's all get our hair cut that's what let's do let's all get our hair cut come on come on come on the others were carried off their feet by the fury of this assault to get their hair cut what joy little did they know if this were fun they only knew that their small leader said it was fun chocolate stained but confident the band marched into william Milch's barber shop we wish to get our hair cut said little cora haughtily Nelcha, in his shirt sleeves, stood looking at them with his half-idiot smile. Hurry now, commanded the queen. A dray horse toiled step by step, step by step, up Bridge Street Hill. A far woman's voice arose. There could be heard the ceaseless hammers of shingling carpenters. All was summer peace. Come on now, who's going first? Come on, Ella, you go first. Getting our hair cut. Oh, what fun! Little Ella Earl would not, however, be first in the chair. She was drawn towards it by a singular fascination, but at the same time she was afraid of it, and so she hung back, saying, No, you go first. No, you go first. The question was precipitated by the twins and one of the Phelps children. They made simultaneous rush for the chair and screamed and kicked, each pair preventing the third child. The queen entered this melee and decided in favor of the Phelps boys. He ascended the chair. Thereat, an odd silence fell upon the band, and always William Nelche smiled fatuously. He tucked a cloth in the neck of the Phelps boy and, taking scissors, began to cut his hair. The group of children came closer and closer. Even the queen was deeply moved. Does it hurt any, she asked in a wee voice. No, nah, said the Phelps boy with dignity. Anyhow, I've had my hair cut afore. When he appeared to them looking very soldierly with his cropped little head, there was a tumult over the chair. The Margate twins howled. Jimmy Trescott was kicking them on the shins. It was a fight. But the twins could not prevail, being the smallest of all the children. The queen herself took the chair and ordered Nelche as if he were a lady's maid. To the floor there fell proud ringlets, blazing even there in their humiliation with a full, fine bronze light. Then Jimmy Trescott, then Ella Earl, two long ash-colored plates, then a Phelps girl, then another Phelps girl, and so on from head to head. The ceremony received unexpected check when the turn came to Dan Earl. This lad, usually docile to any rain, had suddenly grown mulishly obstinate. No, he would not, he would not. He himself did not seem to know why he refused to have his hair cut, but despite the shrill derision of the company, he remained obdurate. Anyhow, the twins, long held in check and now feverishly eager, were already struggling for the chair. And so, to the floor at last, came the golden Margate curls, the heart treasure and glory of a mother, three aunts, and some feminine cousins. All having been finished, the children, highly elate, thronged out into the street. They crowed and cackled with pride and joy, anon turning to scorn the cowardly Dan Earl. Ella Earl was an exception. She had been pensive for some time, and now the shorn little maiden began vaguely to weep. In the door of his shop, William Nelche stood watching them, upon his face a grin of almost inhuman idiocy. Part 2 It now becomes the duty of the unfortunate writer to exhibit these children to their fond parents. Come on, Jibby, cried little Cora, let's go show Mama. And they hurried off, these happy children, to show Mama. The Trescotts and their guests were assembled indolently awaiting the luncheon bell. Jimmy and the angel child burst in upon them. Oh, Mama, shrieked little Cora, see how fine I am? I've had my hair cut. Isn't it splendid? And Jimmy, too. 
The wretched mother took one sight, emitted one yell, and fell into a chair. Mrs. Trescott dropped a large lady's journal and made a nerveless mechanical clutch at it. The painter gripped the arms of his chair and leaned forward, staring until his eyes were like two little clock faces. Dr. Trescott did not move or speak. To the children, the next moments were chaotic. There was a loudly wailing mother and a pale-faced, a gas mother, a stammering father and a grim and terrible father. The angel child did not understand any of it save the voice of calamity, and in a moment all her little imperialism went to the winds. She ran sobbing to her mother, Oh, mamma, mamma, mamma! The desolate Jimmy heard out of this inexplicable situation a voice which he knew well, a sort of colonel's voice, and he obeyed like any good soldier. Jimmy? He stepped three paces to the front. Yes, sir. How did this, how did this happen, said Trescott. Now Jimmy could have explained how had happened anything which had happened, but he did not know what had happened, so he said, I, I, nothing. And, oh, look at her frock, said Mrs. Trescott brokenly. The words turned the mind of the mother of the angel child. She looked up, her eyes blazing. Frock, she repeated. Frock? What do I care for her frock? Frock? She choked out again from the depths of her bitterness. Then she arose suddenly and whirled tragically upon her husband. Look, she declaimed. All oh, her lovely hair. All oh, her lovely hair. Gone. Gone. The painter was apparently in a fit. His jaw was set. His eyes were glazed. His body was stiff and straight. All gone. All her lovely hair. All gone. My poor little darling. My poor little darling. And the angel child added her heartbroken voice to her mother's wail as they fled into each other's arms. In the meantime, Trescott was patiently unraveling some skeins of Jimmy's tangled intellect. And then you went to this barber's on the hill? Yes, and where did you get the money? Yes, I see. And who besides you and Cora had their hair cut? The Margate with? Oh, Lord. Over at the Margate place, old Eldridge Margate, the grandfather of the twins, was in the back garden picking peas and smoking ruminatively to himself. Suddenly, he heard from the house great noises. Doors slammed, women rushed upstairs and downstairs, calling to each other in voices of agony. And then, full and mellow, upon the still air, arose the roar of the twins in pain. Old Eldridge stepped out of the pea patch and moved towards the house, puzzled, staring, not yet having decided that it was his duty to rush forward. Then, around the corner of the house, shot his daughter Molly, her face pale with horror. What's the matter? he cried. Oh, father, she gasped. The children, they... Then around the corner of the house came the twins, howling at the top of their power, their faces flowing with tears. They were still hand in hand, the ruling passion being strong even in their suffering. At sight of them, old Eldridge took his pipe hastily out of his mouth. Good God, he said. And now, what befell one William Nelche, a barber by trade? And what was said by angry parents of the mother of such an angel child? And what was the fate of the angel child herself? There was surely a tempest. With the exception of the Margate twins, the boys could well be eliminated from the affair. Of course, it didn't matter if their hair was cut. Also, the two little Phelps girls had had very short hair anyhow, and their parents were not too greatly incensed. In the case of Ella Earle, it was mainly the pathos of the little girl's own grieving. But her mother played a most generous part and called upon Mrs. Trescott and condoled with the mother of the angel child over their equivalent losses. But the Margate contingent, they simply screeched. Trescott, composed and cool-blooded, was in the middle of a giddy whirl. 
he was not going to allow the mobbing of his wife's cousins nor was he going to pretend that the spoilation of the margate twins was a virtuous and beautiful act he was elected gratuitously to the position of a buffer but curiously enough the one who achieved the bulk of the misery was old eldridge margate who had been picking peas at the time the feminine margates stormed his position as individuals in pairs in teams and en masse in two days they may have aged him seven years he must destroy the utter Nelche. He must midnightly massacre the angel child and her mother. He must dip his arms in blood to the elbows. Trescott took the first opportunity to express to him his concern of the affair. But when the subject of the disaster was mentioned, old Eldridge, to the doctor's great surprise, actually chuckled long and deep. Oh, well, look a here, he said. I never was so much in love with them there damn curls. The curls was purty. Yes, but then I darn sight rather see boys look more like boys than like two little wax figures. And, you know, the little cusses like it themselves. They never took no stock in all this washing and combing and fixing and going to church and parading and showing off. They stood it because they were told to, that's all. Of course, this here Nell T. G., er, whatever his name is, is a plum dumb midget. But I don't see what's to be done now that the kids is full well cropped. I might go and burn his shop over his head, but that wouldn't bring no hair back onto the kids. They're even kicking on sashes now, and that's all right, cause what fur does boy want a sash? Whereupon Trescott perceived the old man wore his brain above his shoulders, and Trescott departed from him rejoicing greatly that it was only women who could not know that there was finality to most disasters, and that when a thing was fully done, no amount of door slamming, rushing upstairs and downstairs, calls, lamentations, tears, could bring back a single hair to the heads of the twins. But the rains came and the winds blew in the most biblical way when a certain fat came in light in the Trescott household. Little Cora, corroborated by Jimmy, innocently remarked that five dollars had been given her by her father on her birthday, and with this money the evil had been wrought. Trescott had known it, but he, thoughtful man, had said nothing. For her part, the mother of the angel child had up to that moment never reflected that the consummation of the wickedness must have cost a small sum of money, but now it was all clear to her. He was the guilty one. He, my angel child. The scene which ensued was inspiring. A few days later, loungers at the railway station saw a lady leading a shorn and still undaunted lamb. Attached to them was a husband and father who was plainly bewildered, but still more plainly vexed, as if he would be saying, Damn him, why can't they leave me alone? End of The Angel Child Recording by Anne Section 2 of Willemville Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Willemville Stories by Stephen Crane. Lynx Hunting. Jimmy lounged about the dining room and watched his mother with large, serious eyes. Suddenly he said, Ma, now can I borrow Pa's gun? She was overcome with the feminine horror which is able to mistake preliminary words for the full accomplishment of the dread thing. "'Why, Jimmy!' she cried. "'Of all wonders! Your father's gun! No, indeed you can't!' He was fairly well crushed, but he managed to mutter sullenly, "'Well, Willie Dalzel, he's got a gun!' In reality, his heart had previously been beating with such tumult, he had himself been so impressed with the daring and sin of his request, that he was glad that all was over now, and his mother could do very little further harm to his sensibilities. He had been influenced into the venture by the larger boys. "'Huh!' the Dalzel urchin had said. 
"'Your father's got a gun, hasn't he? "'Well, why don't you bring that?' "'Puffing himself, Jimmy had replied, "'Well, I can if I want to.' "'It was a black lie, "'but really the Dalzel boy was too outrageous "'with his eternal bill-posting about the gun "'which a beaming uncle had entrusted to him. "'Its possession made him superior in manfulness "'to most boys in the neighbourhood or at least they enviously conceded him such a position. But he was so overbearing, and stuffed the fact of his treasure so relentlessly down their throats, that on this occasion the miserable Jimmy had lied as naturally as most animals swim. Willie Dalzel had not been checkmated, for he had instantly retorted, "'Why don't you get it, then?' "'Well, I can if I want to.' "'Well, get it, then.' "'Well, I can, if I want to.' Thereupon, Jimmy had paced away with great airs of surety as far as the door of his home, where his manner changed to one of tremulous misgiving as it came upon him to address his mother in the dining-room. There had happened that which had happened. When Jimmy returned to his two distinguished companions— he was blown out with a singular pomposity. He spoke these noble words. "'Oh, well, I guess I don't want to take the gun out today.' They had been watching him with gleaming ferret eyes, and they detected his falsity at once. They challenged him with shouted jibes. But it was not in the rules for the conduct of boys that one should admit anything whatsoever, and so Jimmy, backed into an ethical corner— lied as stupidly, as desperately, as hopelessly as ever lone savage fights when surrounded at last in his jungle. Such accusations were never known to come to any point, for the reason that the number and kind of denials always equaled or exceeded the number of accusations, and no boy was ever brought really to book for these misdeeds. In the end they went off together, Willie Dalzel with his gun being a trifle in advance, and discoursing upon his various works. They passed along a maple-lined avenue, a highway common to boys bound for that free land of hills and woods in which they lived in some part their romance of the moment, whether it was of Indians, miners, smugglers, soldiers, or outlaws. The paths were their paths, and much was known to them of the secrets of the dark green hemlock thickets, the wastes of sweet fern and huckleberry, the cliffs of gaunt bluestone, with the sumac burning red at their feet. Each boy had, I am sure, a conviction that some day the wilderness was to give forth to him a marvellous secret. They felt that the hills and the forests knew much, and they heard a voice of it in the silence. It was vague, thrilling, fearful, and altogether fabulous. The grown folk seemed to regard these wastes merely as so much distance between one place and another place, or as a rabbit cover, or as a district to be judged according to the value of the timber. But to the boys it spoke some great inspiring word, which they knew even as those who pace the shore know the enigmatic speech of the surf. In the meantime they live there, in season, lives of ringing adventure, by dint of imagination. The boys left the avenue, skirted hastily through some private grounds, climbed a fence, and entered the thickets. It happened that at school the previous day Willie Dalzel had been forced to read and acquire in some part a solemn description of a lynx. The meagre information thrust upon him had caused him grimaces of suffering, but now he said suddenly, "'I'm going to shoot a lynx!' The other boys admired this statement, but they were silent for a time. Finally Jimmy said meekly, "'What's a lynx?' He had endured his ignorance as long as he was able." The Dalzel boy mocked him. "'Why, don't you know what a lynx is? A lynx? Why, a lynx is an animal something like a cat, 
and it's got great big green eyes, and it sits on the limb of a tree and just glares at you. It's a pretty bad animal, I tell you. Why, when I... Huh, said the third boy. Where do you ever see a lynx? Oh, I've seen em, plenty of em. I bet you'd be scared if you seen one once. Jimmy and the other boy each demanded, How do you know I would? They penetrated deeper into the wood. They climbed a rocky zigzag path, which led them at times where with their hands they could almost touch the tops of giant pines. The gray cliffs sprang sheer towards the sky. Willie Dalzell babbled about his impossible lynx, and they stalked the mountainside like chamois hunters, although no noise of bird or beast broke the stillness of the hills. Below them, Willemville was spread out somewhat like the cheap green and black lithograph of the time, a bird's-eye view of Willemville, New York. In the end, the boys reached the top of the mountain and scouted off among wild and desolate ridges. They were burning with desire to slay large animals. They thought continually of elephants, lions, tigers, crocodiles. They discoursed upon their immaculate conduct in case such monsters confronted them, and they all lied carefully about their courage. The breeze was heavy with the smell of sweet fern. The pines and hemlocks sighed as they waved their branches. In the hollows the leaves of the laurels were lacquered where the sunlight found them. No matter the weather, it would be impossible to long continue an expedition of this kind without a fire, and presently they built one, snapping down for fuel the brittle underbranches of the pines. About this fire they were willed to conduct a sort of play, the Dalzell boy taking the part of a bandit chief and the other boys being his trusty lieutenants. They stalked to and fro, long-strided, stern yet devil-may-care, three terrible little figures. Jimmy had an uncle who made game of him whenever he caught him in this kind of play, and often this uncle quoted derisively the following classic, "'Once aboard the lugger, Bill, and the girl is mine.' Now, to burn the chateau and destroy all evidence of our crime. But hark ye, Bill, no violence. Wheeling abruptly, he addressed these dramatic words to his comrades. They were impressed. They decided at once to be smugglers, and in the most ribald fashion they talked about carrying off young women. At last they continued their march through the woods. The smuggling motif was now grafted fantastically upon the original Lynx idea, which Willie Dalzell refused to abandon at any price. Once they came upon an innocent bird who happened to be looking another way at the time. After a great deal of manoeuvring and big words, Willie Dalzell reared his fowling piece and blew this poor thing into a mere rag of wet feathers, of which he was proud." Afterwards the other big boy had a turn at another bird. Then it was plainly Jimmy's chance. The two others had, of course, some thought of cheating him out of his chance, but of a truth he was timid to explode such a thunderous weapon, and as soon as they detected this fear, they simply overbore him, and made it clearly understood that if he refused to shoot he would lose his cast, his scalp-lock, his girdle, his honour. They had reached the old death-colored snake fence which marked the limits of the upper pasture of the Fleming farm. Under some hickory trees the path ran parallel to the fence. Behold, a small priestly chipmunk came to a rail, and folding his hands on his abdomen, addressed them in his own tongue. It was Jimmy's shot. Abjured by the others, he took the gun. His face was stiff with apprehension. The Dalzell boy was giving forth fine words. "'Go ahead. Ah, oh, don't be afraid. It's nothing to do. Why, I've done it a million times. Don't shut both your eyes now. Just keep one open and shut the other one. He'll get away if you don't watch out. Now you're all right. Why don't you let her go? Go ahead.' Jimmy, with his legs braced apart, was in the center of the path. 
His back was greatly bent, owing to the mechanics of supporting the heavy gun. His companions were screeching in the rear. There was a wait. Then he pulled the trigger. To him there was a frightful roar. His cheek and his shoulder took a stunning blow. His face felt a hot flush of fire, and opening his two eyes, he found that he was still alive. He was not too dazed to instantly adopt a becoming egotism. It had been the first shot of his life. But directly after the well-mannered celebration of this victory, a certain cow, which had been grazing in the line of fire, was seen to break wildly across the pasture, bellowing and bucking. The three smugglers and lynx hunters looked at each other out of blanched faces. Jimmy had hit the cow. The first evidence of his comprehension of this fact was in the celerity with which he returned the discharged gun to Willie Dalzel. They turned to flee. The land was black, as if it had been overshadowed suddenly with thick storm clouds, and even as they fled in their horror, a gigantic Swedish farmhand came from the heavens and fell upon them, shrieking in eerie triumph. In a twinkle they were clouted prostrate. The Swede was elate and ferocious in a foreign and fulsome way. He continued to beat them and yell. From the ground they raised their dismal appeal. Oh, please, mister, we didn't do it. He did it. I didn't do it. We didn't do it. We didn't mean to do it. Oh, please, mister. In these moments of childish terror, little lads go half blind, and it is possible that few moments of their afterlife made them suffer as they did when the Swede flung them over the fence and marched them towards the farmhouse. They begged like cowards on the scaffold, and each one was for himself. Oh, please let me go, mister. I didn't do it, mister. He did it. Oh, please let me go, mister. The boyish view belongs to boys alone, and if this tall and knotted laborer was needlessly without charity, none of the three lads questioned it. Usually, when they were punished, they decided that they deserved it, and the more that they were punished, the more they were convinced that they were criminals of a most subterranean type. As to the hitting of the cow being a pure accident, and therefore not of necessity a criminal matter, such reading never entered their heads. When things happened and they were caught, they commonly paid dire consequences, and they were accustomed to measure the probabilities of woe utterly by the damage done, and not in any way by the culpability. The shooting of the cow was plainly heinous, and undoubtedly their dungeons would be knee-deep in water. "'He did it, mister!' This was a general outcry. Jimmy used it as often as did the others. As for them, it was certain that they had no direct thought of betraying their comrade for their own salvation. They thought themselves guilty because they were caught. When boys were not caught, they might possibly be innocent. But captured boys were guilty. When they cried out that Jimmy was the culprit, it was principally a simple expression of terror. Old Henry Fleming, the owner of the farm, strode across the pasture towards them. He had in his hand a most cruel whip. This whip he flourished. At his approach the boys suffered the agonies of the fire regions, and yet anybody with half an eye could see that the whip in his hand was a mere accident, and that he was a kind old man, when he cared. When he had come near he spoke crisply. "'What you boys been doin' to my cow?' The tone had a deep threat in it. They all answered by saying that none of them had shot the cow. Their denials were tearful and clamorous, and they crawled knee by knee. The vision of it was like three martyrs being dragged towards the stake. Old Fleming stood there, grim, tight-lipped. After a time he said, "'Which boy done it?' There was some confusion, and then Jimmy spake. 
I done it, mister. Fleming looked at him. Then he asked, Well, what did you shoot her for? Jimmy thought, hesitated, decided, faltered, and then formulated this. I thought she was a lynx. Old Fleming and his Swede at once lay down Section 3 of Willemville Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Willemville Stories by Stephen Crane. The Lover and the Telltale. When the angel child returned with her parents to New York, the fond heart of Jimmy Trescott felt its bruise greatly. For two days he simply moped, becoming a stranger to all former joys. When his old comrades yelled invitation as they swept off on some interesting quest, he replied with mournful gestures of disillusion. He thought often of writing to her, but of course the shame of it made him pause. Write a letter to a girl? The mere enormity of the idea caused him shudders. Persons of his quality never wrote letters to girls. Such was the occupation of mollycoddles and snivellers. He knew that if his acquaintances and friends found in him evidences of such weakness and general milkiness, they would fling themselves upon him like so many wolves, and bait him beyond the borders of sanity— However, one day at school, in that time of the morning session when children of his age were allowed fifteen minutes of play in the school grounds, he did not, as usual, rush forth ferociously to his games. Commonly he was of the worst hoodlums, preying upon his weaker brethren with all the cruel disregard of a grown man. On this particular morning he stayed in the schoolroom, and with his tongue stuck from the corner of his mouth, and his head twisting in a painful way, he wrote to little Cora, pouring out to her all the poetry of his hungry soul, as follows. My dear Cora, I love thee with all my heart. Oh, come back again, back, back again, for I love thee best of all. Oh, come back again. When the spring come again, we'll fly, and we'll fly like a brid. As for the last word, he knew under normal circumstances perfectly well how to spell bird, but in this case he had transposed two of the letters through excitement, supreme agitation. Nor had this letter been composed without fear and furtive glancing. There was always a number of children who, for the time, cared more for the quiet of the schoolroom than for the tempest of the playground, and there was always that dismal company who were being forcibly deprived of their recess, who were being kept in. More than one curious eye was turned upon the desperate and lawless Jimmy Trescott, suddenly taken to ways of peace, and as he felt these eyes he flushed guiltily, with felonious glances from side to side. It happened that a certain vigilant little girl had a seat directly across the aisle from Jimmy's seat, and she had remained in the room during the intermission, because of her interest in some absurd domestic details concerning her desk. Parenthetically, it might be stated that she was in the habit of imagining this desk to be a house, and at this time, with an important little frown, indicative of a proper matron, she was engaged in dramatizing her ideas of a household. But this small Rose Goldidge happened to be of a family which numbered few males. It was, in fact, one of those curious middle-class families that hold much of their ground, retain most of their position, after all their visible means of support have been dropped in the grave. It contained now only a collection of women, 
who existed submissively, defiantly, securely, mysteriously, in a pretentious and often exasperating virtue. It was often too triumphantly clear that they were free of bad habits. However, bad habits is a term here used in a commoner meaning, because it is certainly true that the principal and indeed solitary joy which entered their lonely lives was the joy of talking wickedly and busily about their neighbors. It was all done without dream of its being of the vulgarity of the alleys. Indeed, it was simply a constitutional but not incredible chastity and honesty, expressing itself in its ordinary superior way of the whirling circles of life and the vehemence of the criticism was not lessened by a further infusion of an acid of worldly defeat, worldly suffering, and worldly hopelessness. Out of this family circle had sprung the typical little girl who discovered Jimmy Trescott agonizingly writing a letter to his sweetheart. Of course, all the children were the most abandoned gossips, but she was peculiarly adapted to the purpose of making Jimmy miserable over this particular point. It was her life to sit of evenings about the stove, and hearken to her mother and a lot of spinsters talk of many things. During these evenings she was never licensed to utter an opinion either one way or the other way. She was then simply a very little girl sitting open-eyed in the gloom, and listening to many things which she often interpreted wrongly. They, on their part, kept up a kind of smug-faced pretense of concealing from her information in detail of the widespread crime, which pretense may have been more elaborately dangerous than no pretense at all. Thus all her home teaching fitted her to recognize at once in Jimmy Trescott's manner that he was concealing something that would properly interest the world. She set up a scream. Oh, 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 Jimmy Trescott's writing to his girl. Oh, oh. Jimmy cast a miserable glance upon her, a glance in which hatred mingled with despair. Through the open window he could hear the boisterous cries of his friends, his hoodlum friends, who would no more understand the utter poetry of his position than they would understand an ancient tribal sign language. His face was set in a truer expression of horror than any of the romances describe upon the features of a man flung into a moat, a man shot in the breast with an arrow, a man cleft in the neck with a battle-axe. He was suppidaneous of the fullest power of childish pain. His one course was to rush upon her and attempt, by an impossible means of strangulation, to keep her important news from the public. The teacher, a thoughtful young woman at her desk upon the platform, saw a little scuffle which informed her that two of her scholars were larking. She called out sharply. The command penetrated to the middle of an early world struggle. In Jimmy's age there was no particular scruple in the minds of the male sex against laying warrior hands upon their weaker sisters. But, of course, this voice from the throne hindered Jimmy in what might have been a berserk attack. Even the little girl was retarded by the voice, but without being unlawful, she managed soon to shy through the door and out upon the playground, yelling, "'Oh, Jimmy Trescott's been writing to his girl!' The unhappy Jimmy was following as closely as he was allowed by his knowledge of the decencies to be preserved under the eye of the teacher. Jimmy himself was mainly responsible for the scene which ensued on the playground. It is possible that the little girl might have run, shrieking his infamy, without exciting more than a general but unmilitant interest. These barbarians were excited only by the actual appearance of human woe. In that event they cheered and danced. Jimmy made the strategic mistake of pursuing little Rose, and thus exposed his thin skin to the whole school. He had in his cowering mind a vision of a hundred children turning from their play under the maple trees and speeding towards him over the gravel with sudden wild taunts. 
upon him drove a yelping demoniac mob in which his words were futile he saw in this mob boys that he dimly knew and his deadly enemies and his retainers and his most intimate friends the virulence of his deadly enemy was no greater than the virulence of his intimate friend from the outskirts the little informer could be heard still screaming the news like a toy parrot with a clockwork inside of it it broke up all sorts of games not so much because of the mere fact of the letter writing as because the children knew that some sufferer was at the last point and like little blood-fanged wolves they thronged to the scene of his destruction they galloped about him shrilly chanting insults he turned from one to another only to meet with howls he was baited then in one instant he changed all this with a blow bang the most pitiless of the boys near him received a punch fairly and skilfully which made him bellow out like a walrus and then jimmy lay desperately into the whole world striking out frenziedly in all directions boys who could handily whip him and knew it backed away from this onslaught here was intention serious intention they themselves were not in frenzy and their cooler judgment respected jimmy's efforts when he ran amuck they saw that it really was none of their affair in the meantime the wretched little girl who had caused the bloody riot was away by the fence weeping because boys were fighting jimmy several times hit the wrong boy that is to say he several times hit a wrong boy hard enough to arouse also in him a spirit of strife jimmy wore a little shirt-waist it was passing now rapidly into oblivion he was sobbing and there was one blood-stain upon his cheek the school ground sounded like a pine tree when a hundred crows roost in it at night then upon the situation there pealed a brazen bell it was a bell that these children obeyed even as older nations obey the formal law which is printed in calfskin it smote them into some sort of inaction even jimmy was influenced by its potency although as a finale he kicked out lustily into the legs of an intimate friend who had been one of the foremost in the torture when they came to form into line for the march into the schoolroom it was curious that jimmy had many admirers it was not his prowess it was the soul he had infused into his gymnastics and he still panting looked about him with a stern and challenging glare and yet when the long tramping line had entered the schoolroom his status had again changed the other children then began to regard him as a boy in disrepair, and boys in disrepair were always accosted ominously from the throne. Jimmy's march towards his seat was a feat. It was composed partly of a most slinking attempt to dodge the perceptions of the teacher, and partly of pure braggadocio erected for the benefit of his observant fellow-men the teacher looked carefully down at him jimmy trescott she said yes m he answered with business-like briskness which really spelled out falsity in all its letters come up to the desk he rose amid the awe of the entire schoolroom when he arrived she said jimmy you've been fighting yes m he answered this was not so much an admission of the fact as it was a concessional answer to anything she might say who have you been fighting she asked i don't know em whereupon the empress blazed out in wrath you don't know who you've been fighting jimmy looked at her gloomily no em she seemed about to disintegrate to mere flaming faggots of anger. "'You don't know who you've been fighting,' she demanded, blazing. "'Well, you stay in after school until you find out.' As he returned to his place, all the children knew by his vanquished air that sorrow had fallen upon the house of Trescott." 
when he took his seat, he saw gloating upon him the satanic black Section 4 of Willemville Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Willemville Stories by Stephen Crane. Showin' Off. Jimmy Trescott's new velocipede had the largest front wheel of any velocipede in Willemville. When it first arrived from New York, he wished to sacrifice school, food, and sleep to it. Evidently, he wished to become a sort of perpetual velocipede rider. But the powers of the family laid a number of judicious embargoes upon him, and he was prevented from becoming a fanatic. Of course, this caused him to retain a fondness for the three-wheeled thing much longer than if he had been allowed to debauch himself for a span of days. But in the end, it was an immaterial machine to him. For long periods, he left it idle in the stable. One day, he loitered from school towards home by a very circuitous route. He was accompanied by only one of his retainers. The object of this detour was the wooing of a little girl in a red hood. He had been in love with her for some three weeks. His desk was near her desk in school, but he had never spoken to her. He had been afraid to take such a radical step. It was not customary to speak to girls. Even boys who had school-going sisters seldom addressed them during that part of a day which was devoted to education. The reasons for this conduct were very plain. First, the more robust boys considered talking with girls an unmanly occupation. Second, the greater part of the boys were afraid. Third, they had no idea of what to say, because they esteemed the proper sentences should be supernaturally incisive and eloquent. In consequence, a small contingent of blue-eyed weaklings were the sole intimates of the frail sex, and for it they were boisterously and disdainfully called girl-boys. But this situation did not prevent serious and ardent wooing. For instance, Jimmy and the little girl who wore the red hood must have exchanged glances at least two hundred times in every school hour, and this exchange of glances accomplished everything. In them the two children renewed their curious, inarticulate vows. Jimmy had developed a devotion to school which was the admiration of his father and mother. In the mornings he was so impatient to have it made known to him that no misfortune had befallen his romance during the night that he was actually detected at times feverishly listening for the first bell. Dr. Trescott was exceedingly complacent of the change, and as for Mrs. Trescott, she had ecstatic visions of a white-haired Jimmy leading the nations in knowledge, comprehending all from bugs to comets. It was merely the doing of the little girl in the red hood. When Jimmy made up his mind to follow his sweetheart home from school, the project seemed such an arbitrary and shameless innovation that he hastily lied to himself about it. No, he was not following Abby. He was merely making his way homeward through the new and rather longer route of Bryant Street and Oakland Park. It had nothing at all to do with a girl. It was a mere eccentric notion. "'Come on,' said Jimmy, gruffly to his retainer. "'Let's go on this way.' "'What fur?' demanded the retainer. "'Oh, because.' "'Huh?' "'Oh, uh, it's more fun going this way.' The retainer was bored and loath, but that mattered very little. He did not know how to disobey his chief. Together they followed the trail of red-hooded Abby and another small girl. These latter at once understood the object of the chase, and, looking back giggling, they pretended to quicken their pace. But they were always looking back. 
Jimmy now began his courtship in earnest. The first thing to do was to prove his strength in battle. This was transacted by means of the retainer. He took that devoted boy and flung him heavily to the ground, meanwhile mouthing a preposterous ferocity. The retainer accepted this behaviour with a sort of bland resignation. After his overthrow he raised himself, coolly brushed some dust and dead leaves from his clothes, and then seemed to forget the incident. "'I can jump farther than you can,' said Jimmy in a loud voice. "'I know it,' responded the retainer, simply. "'But this would not do. There must be a contest.' "'Come on!' shouted Jimmy imperiously. "'Let's see you jump!' The retainer selected a footing on the curb, balanced and calculated a moment, and jumped without enthusiasm. Jimmy's leap, of course, was longer. "'There!' he cried, blowing out his lips. "'I beat you, didn't I? Easy! I beat you!' He made a great hubbub, as if the affair was unprecedented. "'Yes,' admitted the other, emotionless. Later, Jimmy forced his retainer to run a race with him, held more jumping matches, flung him twice to earth, and generally behaved as if a retainer were indestructible. If the retainer had been in the plot, it is conceivable that he would have endured the treatment with mere whispered, half-laughing protests, but he was not in the plot at all, and so he became enigmatic. One cannot often sound the profound well in which lie the meanings of boyhood. Following the two little girls, Jimmy eventually passed into that suburb of Willemville which is called Oakland Park. At his heels came a badly battered retainer. Oakland Park was a somewhat strange country to the boys. They were dubious of the manners and customs, and, of course, they would have to meet the local chieftains, who might look askance upon this invasion. Jimmy's girl departed into her home with a last backward glance that almost blinded the thrilling boy. On this pretext, and that pretext, he kept his retainer in play before the house. He had hopes that she would emerge as soon as she had deposited her school bag. A boy came along the walk. Jimmy knew him at school. He was Tommy Semple, one of the weaklings who made friends with the fair sex. "'Hello, Tom,' said Jimmy. "'You live around here?' "'Yeah,' said Tom, with composed pride. At school he was afraid of Jimmy, but he did not evince any of this fear as he strolled well inside his own frontiers. Jimmy and his retainer had not expected this boy to display the manners of a minor chief, and they contemplated him attentively. There was a silence. Finally, Jimmy said, "'I can put you down,' he moved forward briskly. "'Can't I?' he demanded. The challenged boy backed away. "'I know you can,' he declared frankly and promptly. The little girl in the red hood had come out with a hoop. She looked at Jimmy with an air of insolent surprise in the fact that he still existed, and began to trundle her hoop off towards some other little girls who were shrilly playing near a nursemaid and a perambulator. Jimmy adroitly shifted his position until he too was playing near the perambulator, pretentiously making mincemeat out of his retainer and Tommy Semple. Of course little Abby had defined the meaning of Jimmy's appearance in Oakland Park. Despite this nonchalance and grand air of accident, nothing could have been more plain. Whereupon she, of course, became insufferably vain in manner, and whenever Jimmy came near her she tossed her head and turned away her face and daintily swished her skirts, as if he were contagion itself. But Jimmy was happy. His soul was satisfied with the mere presence of the beloved object, so long as he could feel that she furtively gazed upon him from time to time, and noted his extraordinary prowess, which he was proving upon the persons of his retainer and Tommy Semple. And he was making an impression. There could be no doubt of it. He had many times caught her eye fixed admiringly upon him, as he mauled the retainer. Indeed, all the little girls gave attention to his deeds, and he was the hero of the hour. 
Presently a boy on a velocipede was seen to be tooling down towards them. "'Who's this coming?' said Jimmy bluntly to the simple boy. "'That's Horace Glenn,' said Tommy. "'And he's got a new velocipede, and he can ride it like anything.' "'Can you lick him?' asked Jimmy. "'I don't—I I never fought with him,' answered the other. He bravely tried to appear as a man of respectable achievement, but with Horace coming towards them, the risk was too great. However, he added, "'Maybe I could.' The advent of Horace on his new velocipede created a sensation which he haughtily accepted as a familiar thing. Only Jimmy and his retainer remained silent and impassive. Horace eyed the two invaders. "'Hello, Jimmy. Hello, Horace.' After the typical silence, Jimmy said pompously, "'I got a velocipede.' "'Have you?' asked Horace anxiously. He did not wish anybody in the world but himself to possess a velocipede. "'Yes,' sang Jimmy, "'and it's a bigger one than that, too. A good deal bigger. And it's a better one, too.' "'Huh,' retorted Horace skeptically. "'Ain't I, Clarence? Ain't I? Ain't I got one bigger than that?' The retainer answered with alacrity. "'Yes, he has. A good deal bigger. And it's a dindy, too.' This corroboration rather disconcerted Horace, but he continued to scoff at any statement that Jimmy also owned a velocipede. As for the contention that this supposed velocipede could be larger than his own, he simply wouldn't hear of it. Jimmy had been a very gallant figure before the coming of Horace, but the new velocipede had relegated him to a squalid secondary position, so he affected to look with contempt upon it. Voluminously he bragged of the velocipede in the stable at home. He painted its virtues and beauty in loud and extravagant words, flaming words, and the retainer stood by, glibly endorsing everything. The little company heeded him, and he passed on vociferously from extravagance to utter impossibility. Horace was very sick of it. His defense was reduced to a mere mechanical grumbling— don't believe you got one tall. Don't believe you got one tall. Jimmy turned upon him suddenly. How fast can you go? How fast can you go? He demanded. Let's see. I bet you can't go fast. Horace lifted his spirits and answered with proper defiance. Can't I? He mocked. Can't I? No, you can't, said Jimmy. You can't go fast. Horace cried. "'Well, you see me now. I'll show you. I'll show you if I can't go fast.' Taking a firm seat on his vermilion machine, he pedaled furiously up the walk, turned, and pedaled back again. "'There now!' he shouted triumphantly. "'Ain't that fast! There now!' There was a low murmur of appreciation from the little girls. Jimmy saw with pain that even his divinity was smiling upon his rival. There! Ain't that fast! Ain't that fast! He strove to pin Jimmy down to an admission. He was exuberant with victory. Notwithstanding a feeling of discomfiture, Jimmy did not lose a moment of time. Why! he yelled. That ain't going fast tall! That ain't going fast tall! "'Why, I can go almost twice as fast as that. "'Almost twice as fast, can't I, Clarence?' "'The royal retainer nodded solemnly at the wide-eyed group. "'Course you can.' "'Why,' spouted Jimmy, "'you just ought to see me ride once. "'You just ought to see me. "'Why, I can go like the wind, can't I, Clarence? "'And I can ride far, too. "'Oh, awful far, can't I, Clarence?' Why, I wouldn't have that one. Tain't any good. You just ought to see mine once. The overwhelmed Horace attempted to reconstruct his battered glories. I can ride right over the curbstone at some of the crossings, he announced brightly. Jimmy's derision was a splendid sight. Right over the curbstone. Why, that wouldn't be nothing for me to do. I rode mine down Bridge Street Hill. 
Yes, sir, ain't I, Clarence? Why, it ain't nothing to ride over a curbstone. Not for me, is it, Clarence? Down Bridge Street Hill? You never, said Horace hopelessly. Well, didn't I, Clarence? Didn't I now? The faithful retainer again nodded solemnly at the assemblage. At last, Horace, having fallen as low as was possible, began to display a spirit for climbing up again. "'Oh, you can do wonders,' he said, laughing. "'You can do wonders. I suppose you could ride down that bank there?' he asked with art. He had indicated a grassy terrace some six feet in height, which bounded one side of the walk. At the bottom was a small ravine in which the reckless had flung ashes and tins. "'I suppose you could ride down the bank?' All eyes were now turned upon Jimmy to detect a sign of his weakening, but he instantly and sublimely arose to the occasion. "'That bank?' he asked scornfully. "'Why, I've ridden down banks like that many a time, ain't I, Clarence?' This was too much for the company. A sound like the wind in the leaves arose. It was the song of incredulity and ridicule. Oh! And on the outskirts, a little girl suddenly shrieked out, Storyteller! Horace had certainly won a skirmish. He was gleeful. Oh, you can do wonders, he gurgled. You can do wonders! The neighborhood's superficial hostility to foreigners arose like magic under the influence of his sudden success, and Horace had the delight of seeing Jimmy persecuted in that manner known only to children and insects. Jimmy called angrily to the boy on the velocipede. "'If you'll lend me yours, I'll show you whether I can or not.' Horace turned his superior nose in the air. "'Oh, no, I don't ever lend it.' Then he thought of a blow which would make Jimmy's humiliation complete. "'Besides,' he said airily, "'tain't really anything hard to do. I could do it, easy, if I wanted to.' But his supposed adherents, instead of receiving this boast with cheers, looked upon him in a sudden blank silence. Jimmy and his retainer pounced like cats upon their advantage." Oh, they yelled, you could, eh? Well, let's see you do it, then. Let's see you do it. Let's see you do it, now. In a moment, the crew of little spectators were jibing at Horace. The blow that would make Jimmy's humiliation complete. Instead, it had boomeranged Horace into the mud. He kept up a sullen muttering, Tain't really anything. I could if I wanted to. "'Dare you to!' screeched Jimmy and his partisans. "'Dare you to! Dare you to! Dare you to!' There were two things to be done, to make gallant effort or to retreat. Somewhat to their amazement, the children at last found Horace moving through their clamor to the edge of the bank. Sitting on the velocipede, he looked at the ravine, and then, with gloomy pride, at the other children." A hush came upon them, for it was seen that he was intending to make some kind of an anti-mortem statement. I, he began. Then he vanished from the edge of the walk. The start had been unintentional, an accident. The stupefied Jimmy saw the calamity through a haze. His first clear vision was when Horace, with a face as red as a red flag, arose bawling from his tangled velocipede. He and his retainer exchanged a glance of horror and fled the neighborhood. They did not look back until they had reached the top of the hill near the lake. They could see Horace walking slowly under the maples towards his home, pushing his shattered velocipede before him. His chin was thrown high and Section 5 of Willemville Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Willemville Stories by Stephen Crane. Making an Orator. In the school at Willemville, it was the habit, when children had progressed to a certain class, to have them devote Friday afternoon to what was called elocution. This was in the piteously ignorant belief that orators were thus made. By process of school law, unfortunate boys and girls were dragged up to address their fellow scholars in the literature of the mid-century. Probably the children who were most capable of expressing themselves, the children who were most sensitive to the power of speech, suffered the most wrong. Little blockheads, who could learn eight lines of conventional poetry, and could get up and spin it rapidly at their classmates, did not undergo a single pang. The plan operated mainly to agonize many children permanently against arising to speak their thought to fellow creatures. Jimmy Trescott had an idea that, by exhibition of undue ignorance, he could escape from being promoted into the first classroom, which exacted such penalty from its inmates. He preferred to dwell in a less classic shade, rather than venture into a domain where he was obliged to perform a certain duty which struck him as being worse than death. However, willy-nilly, he was somehow sent ahead into the place of torture. Every Friday, at least ten of the little children had to mount the stage beside the teacher's desk and babble something which none of them understood. This was to make them orators. If it had been ordered that they should croak like frogs, it would have advanced most of them just as far towards oratory. Alphabetically, Jimmy Trescott was near the end of the list of victims, but his time was none the less inevitable. Tanner, Timmins, Trass, Trescott, he saw his downfall approaching. He was passive to the teacher, while she drove into his mind the incomprehensible lines of the charge of the light brigade. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward. He had no conception of a league. If in the ordinary course of life somebody had told him that he was half a league from home, he might have been frightened that half a league was fifty miles. But he struggled manfully with the valley of death and a mystic six hundred, who were performing something there which was very fine, he had been told. He learned all the verses. But as his own Friday afternoon approached, he was moved to make known to his family that a dreadful disease was upon him, and was likely at any time to prevent him from going to his beloved school. On the great Friday, when the children of his initials were to speak their pieces, Dr. Trescott was away from home, and the mother of the boy was alarmed beyond measure at Jimmy's curious illness, which caused him to lie on the rug in front of the fire and groan cavernously. She bathed his feet in hot mustard water until they were lobster red. She also placed a mustard plaster on his chest. He announced that these remedies did him no good at all, no good at all. With an air of martyrdom, he endured a perfect downpour of motherly attention all that day. Thus the first Friday was passed in safety. With singular patience, he sat before the fire in the dining-room and looked at picture-books, only complaining of pain when he suspected his mother of thinking that he was getting better. The next day being Saturday and a holiday, he was miraculously delivered from the arms of disease, and went forth to play a blatantly healthy boy. He had no further attack until Thursday night of the next week, when he announced that he felt very, very poorly. The mother was already chronically alarmed over the condition of her son, but Dr. Trescott asked him questions which denoted some incredulity. On the third Friday, Jimmy was dropped at the door of the school from the doctor's buggy. The other children, notably those who had already passed over the mountain of distress, looked at him with glee, seeing in him another lamb brought to butchery. Seated at his desk in the schoolroom, Jimmy sometimes remembered with dreadful distinctness 
every line of the charge of the light brigade, and at other times his mind was utterly empty of it. Geography, arithmetic, and spelling, usually great tasks, quite rolled off him. His mind was dwelling with terror upon the time when his name should be called, and he was obliged to go up to the platform, turn, bow, and recite his message to his fellow men. Desperate expedients for delay came to him. If he could have engaged the services of a real pain, he would have been glad. But steadily, inexorably, the minutes marched on towards his great crisis, and all his plans for escape blended into a mere panic fear. The maples outside were defeating the weakening rays of the afternoon sun, and in the shadowed schoolroom had come a stillness, in which, nevertheless, one could feel the complacence of the little pupils who had already passed through the flames. They were calmly prepared to recognize as a spectacle the torture of others. Little Johnny Tanner opened the ceremony. He stamped heavily up to the platform, and bowed in such a manner that he almost fell down. He blurted out that it would ill befit him to sit silent while the name of his fair Ireland was being reproached, and he appealed to the gallant soldier before him if every British battlefield was not sown with the bones of sons of the Emerald Isle. He was also heard to say that he had listened with deepening surprise and scorn to the insinuation of the honourable member from North Glenmorganshire that the loyalty of the Irish regiments in Her Majesty's service could be questioned. To what purpose, then, he asked, had the blood of Irishmen flowed on a hundred fields? To what purpose had Irishmen gone to their death with bravery and devotion in every part of the world where the victorious flag of England had been carried? If the honourable member for North Glenmorganshire insisted upon construing a mere pothouse row between soldiers in Dublin into a grand treachery to the colours and to Her Majesty's uniform, then it was time for Ireland to think bitterly of her dead sons, whose graves now marked every step of England's progress, and yet who could have their honours stripped from them so easily by the honourable member for North Glenmorganshire. Furthermore, the honourable member for North Glenmorganshire... It is needless to say that little Johnny Tanner's language made it exceedingly hot for the honourable member for North Glenmorganshire. But Johnny was not angry, he was only in haste. He finished the honourable member for North Glenmorganshire in what might be called a gallop. Susie Timmins then went to the platform, and with a face as pale as death whisperingly reiterated that she would be Queen of the May. The child represented there a perfect picture of unnecessary suffering. Her small lips were quite blue, and her eyes, opened wide, stared with a look of horror at nothing. The phlegmatic Trass boy, with his moon face only expressing peasant parentage, calmly spoke some undeniably true words concerning destiny. In his seat, Jimmy Trescott was going half-blind with fear of his approaching doom. He wished that the Trass boy would talk forever about destiny. If the schoolhouse had taken fire, he thought that he would have felt simply relief. Anything was better. Death amid flames was preferable to a recital of the charge of the light brigade. But the Trass boy finished his remarks about destiny in a very short time. Jimmy heard the teacher call his name, and he felt the whole world look at him. He did not know how he made his way to the stage. Parts of him seemed to be of lead, and at the same time parts of him seemed to be light as air, detached. His face had gone as pale as had been the face of Susie Timmins. He was simply a child in torment. That is all there is to be said specifically about it and to intelligent people the exhibition would have been not more edifying than a dog-fight. He bowed precariously, choked, made an inarticulate sound, and then he suddenly said, "'Half a leg!' "'League!' said the teacher coolly. "'Half a leg!' "'League!' said the teacher. "'League!' repeated Jimmy wildly. 
half a league, half a league, half a league onward. He paused here and looked wretchedly at the teacher. Half a league, he muttered, half a league. He seemed likely to keep continuing this phrase indefinitely, so after a time the teacher said, Well, go on. Half a league, responded Jimmy. The teacher had the opened book before her, and she read from it, All in the valley of death rode the... Go on, she concluded. Jimmy said, All in the valley of death rode the... 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 He cast a glance of supreme appeal upon the teacher, and breathlessly whispered, Rode the what? The young woman flushed with indignation to the roots of her hair. "'Road the six hundred, she snapped at him. The class was a rustle with delight at this cruel display. They were no better than a Roman populace in Nero's time. Jimmy started off again. H "'Half a leg, league, half a league, half a league onward. All in the valley of death rode the six hundred. "'Forward, forward, forward!' "'The light brigade,' suggested the teacher sharply. "'The light brigade,' said Jimmy. "'He was about to die of the ignoble pain of his position. "'As for Tennyson's lines, they had all gone grandly out of his mind, "'leaving it a whited wall. "'The teacher's indignation was still rampant. "'She looked at the miserable wretch before her with an angry stare.' "'You stay in after school and learn that all over again,' she commanded, "'and be prepared to speak it next Friday. "'I am astonished at you, Jimmy. "'Go to your seat.' "'If she had suddenly and magically made a spirit of him "'and left him free to soar high above all the travail of our earthly lives, "'she could not have overjoyed him more.' He fled back to his seat without hearing the low-toned jibes of his schoolmates. He gave no thought to the terrors of next Friday. The evils of the day had been sufficient, and to a childish mind a week is a great space of time. With the delightful inconsistency of his age he sat in blissful calm and watched the sufferings of an unfortunate boy named Zimmerman, who was the next victim of education. Jimmy, of course, did not know that on this day there had been laid for him the foundation of a finished incapacity for public speech. Section 6 of Willemville Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Willemville Stories by Stephen Crane Shame Don't come in here bothering me, said the cook intolerantly. What with your mother being away on a visit and your father coming home soon to lunch, I have enough on my mind, and that without being bothered with you. The kitchen is no place for little boys anyhow. Run away, and don't be interfering with my work. She frowned and made a great pretense of being deep in Herculean labors. But Jimmy did not run away. Now, they're going to have a picnic, he said half audibly. What? Now, they're going to have a picnic. Who's going to have a picnic? demanded the cook loudly. Her accent could have led one to suppose that if the projectors did not turn out to be the proper parties, she immediately would forbid this picnic. Jimmy looked at her with more hopefulness. After twenty minutes of futile skirmishing, he had at least succeeded in introducing the subject. To her question, he answered eagerly, Oh, everybody, lots and lots of boys and girls, everybody. Who's everybody? According to custom, Jimmy began to sing song through his nose in a quite indescribable fashion, an enumeration of the prospective picnickers. 
Willie Dalzell and Dan Earl and Ella Earl and Walcott Margate and Freeze Margate and Walter Phelps and Homer Phelps and Minnie Phelps and oh, lots more girls and everybody and their mothers and big sisters too. Then he announced a new bit of information. They're going to have a picnic. Well, let them, said the cook blandly. Jimmy fidgeted for a time in silence. At last he murmured, I, now, I thought maybe you'd let me go. The cook looked from her work with an air of irritation and amazement that Jimmy should still be in the kitchen. Who's stopping you? she asked sharply. I ain't stopping you, am I? No, admitted Jimmy in a low voice. Well, why don't you go then? Nobody's stopping you. But, said Jimmy, I, you, now, each feller has got to take something to eat with him. Oh, uh, ho, cried the cook triumphantly. So that's it, is it? So that what you been shot around here for? I, well, you may as well take yourself off without more words. What, with your mother being away on a visit and your father coming home soon to his lunch? I have enough on my mind, and that without being bothered with you. Jimmy made no reply, but moved in grief towards the door. The cook continued. Some people in this house seem to think there's about a thousand cooks in this kitchen. Where I used to work for, there was some reason in them. I ain't a horse. A picnic. Jimmy said nothing, but he loitered. Seems as if I had enough to do without having you come round talk about picnics. Nobody ever seems to think of the work I have to do. Nobody ever seems to think of it. Then they come and they talk to me about picnics. What do I care about picnics? Jimmy loitered. Well, I used to work before there was some reason in them. I never heard tell of no picnics right on top of your mother being away on a visit and your father coming home soon to his lunch. It's all foolishness. Little Jimmy leaned his head flat against the wall and began to weep. She stared at him scornfully. Crying, eh? Crying? What you crying for? No, nothing, sobbed Jimmy. There was a silence, save for Jimmy's convulsive breathing. At length, the cook said, Stop that blubbering now. Stop it. It ain't no pace for it. Stop it. Very well. If you don't stop, I won't give you nothing to go on the picnic with. There. For the moment, he could not end his tears. You never said, he sputtered, you never said you'd give me anything. Then why would I? She cried angrily. Why would I with you in here a crying and a blubbering and a bleating round? Enough to drive a woman crazy. I don't see how you could expect me to. The idea. Suddenly, Jimmy announced, I've stopped crying. I ain't going to cry no more at all. Well, then, grumbled the cook. Well, then, stop it. I've got enough on my mind. It chanced that she was making for luncheon some salmon croquets. A tin still half full of pinky prepared fish was beside her on the table. Still grumbling, she seized a loaf of bread and wielding a knife, she cut from this loaf four slices, each of which was as big as a six shilling novel. She profligately spread them with butter and jabbing the point of her knife into the salmon tin, she brought up bits of salmon, which she flung and flattened upon the bread. Then she crashed the pieces of bread together in pairs, much as one would clash cymbals. There was no doubt in her own mind but that she had created two sandwiches. There, she cried. That'll do you all right. Let me see. Will I put them in? There. I've got it. She thrust the sandwiches into a small pail and jammed on the lid. Jimmy was ready for the picnic. Oh, thank you, Mary, he cried joyfully and in a moment he was off, running swiftly. The picnickers had started nearly half an hour earlier, owing to his inability to quickly attack and subdue the cook, but he knew that the rendezvous was in the grove of tall, pillar-like hemlocks and pines that grew on a rocky knoll at the lake shore. His heart was very light as he sped, swinging his pail, but a few minutes previously his soul had been gloomed in despair. Now he was happy, he was going to the picnic where privilege of participation was to be bought by the contents of the little tin pail when he arrived in the outskirts of the grove he heard a merry clamour 
and when he reached the top of the knoll he looked down the slope upon a scene which almost made his little breast burst with joy they actually had two campfires two campfires at one of them mrs earl was making something chocolate no doubt and at the other a young lady in white duck and a sailor hat was dropping eggs into boiling water other grown-up people had spread a white cloth and were laying upon it things from baskets in the deep cool shadow of the trees the children scurried laughing jimmy hastened forward to join his friends homer phelps caught first sight of him ho he shouted here comes jimmy trescott come on jimmy you be on our side the children had divided themselves into two bands for some purpose of play the others of homer phelps party loudly endorsed his plan yes jimmy you be on our side then arose the usual dispute well we got the weakest side tain't any weaker than ours homer phelps suddenly started and looking hard said what you got my pail jim jimmy answered somewhat uneasily got me lunch in it instantly that brat of a minnie phelps simply tore down the sky with her shrieks of derision got his lunch in it in a pail she ran screaming to her mother oh mamma oh mamma jimmy trescott's got his picnic in a pail now there was nothing in the nature of this fact to particularly move the others notably the boys who were not competent to care if he had brought his luncheon in a coal bin but such is the instinct of childish society that they all immediately moved away from him in a moment he had been made a social leper all old intimacies were flung into the lake so to speak they dared not compromise themselves at safe distances the boy shouted scornfully huh got his picnic in a pail never again during that picnic did the little girl speak of him as jimmy trescott his name now was him his mind was dark with pain as he stood the hang-dog kicking the gravel and muttering as defiantly as he was able well i can have it in a pail if i want to this statement of freedom was of no importance and he knew it but it was the only idea in his head he had been baited at school for being detected in writing a letter to little cora the angel child and he had known how to defend himself but this situation was in no way similar this was a social affair with grown people on all sides it would be sweet to catch the margate twins for instance and hammer them into a state of bleeding respect for his pail but that was a matter for the jungles of childhood where grown folks seldom penetrated he could only glower the amiable voice of mrs earl suddenly called come children everything's ready they scampered away glancing back for one last gloat at jimmy standing near with his pail he did not know what to do he knew that the grown folk expected him at the spread but if he approached he would be greeted by a shameful chorus from the children more especially from some of those damnable little girls still luxuries beyond all dreaming were heaped on that cloth one could not forget them perhaps if he crept up modestly and was very gentle and very nice to the little girls they would allow him peace of course it had been dreadful to come with a pail to such a grand picnic but they might forgive him oh no they would not he knew them better and then suddenly he remembered with what delightful expectations he had raced to this grove and self-pity overwhelmed him and he thought he wanted to die and make every one feel sorry the young lady in white duck and a sailor hat looked at him and then spoke to her sister mrs earl who's that hovering in the distance emily mrs earl peered why is jimmy trescott jimmy come to the picnic why don't you come to the picnic jimmy he began to sidle towards the cloth but at mrs earl's call there was another outburst from many of the children he's got his picnic in a pail in a pail got it in the pail minnie phelps was a shrill fiend oh mamma he's got it in that pail see isn't it funny isn't it dreadful funny what ghastly prigs children are emily said the young lady they are spoiling that boy's whole day breaking his heart the little cats i think i'll go over and talk to him maybe you better not 
answered mrs earle dubiously somehow these things arrange themselves if you interfere you are likely to prolong everything well i'll try at least said the young lady at the second outburst against him jimmy had crouched down by a tree half hiding behind it half pretending that he was not hiding behind it he turned his sad gaze towards the lake the bit of water seen through the shadows seemed perpendicular a slate-coloured wall he heard a noise near him and turning he perceived the young lady looking down at him in her hand she held plates may i sit near you she asked coolly jimmy could hardly believe his ears after disposing herself and the plates upon the pine needles she made brief explanation they're rather crowded you see over there i don't like to be crowded at a picnic so i thought i'd come here i hope you don't mind jimmy made haste to find his tongue oh i don't mind i like to have you here the ingenious emphasis made it appear that the fact of his liking to have her there was in the nature of a law-dispelling phenomenon but she did not smile how large is that lake she asked jimmy falling into the snare at once began to talk in the manner of a proprietor of the lake oh it's almost twenty miles long and in one place it's almost four miles wide and it's deep too awful deep and it's got real steamboats on it and oh lots of other boats and 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 do you go out on it sometimes oh lots of times my father's got a boat he said eyeing her to note the effect of his words she was correctly pleased and struck with wonder oh has he she cried as if she never before had heard of a man owning a boat jimmy continued yes and it's a great big boat too with sails real sails and sometimes he takes me out in her too and once he took me fishing and we had sandwiches plenty of em and my father he drank beer right out of the bottle right out of the bottle the young lady was properly overwhelmed by this amazing intelligence jimmy saw the impression he had created and he enthusiastically resumed his narrative and after he let me throw the bottles in the water and i throwed em way 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 out and they sank and never come up he concluded dramatically his face was glorified he had forgotten all about the pail he was absorbed in this communion with a beautiful lady who was so interested in what he had to say she indicated one of the plates and said indifferently perhaps you would like some of those sandwiches i made them do you like olives and there's a deviled egg i made that also did you really said jimmy politely his face gloomed for a moment because the pail was recalled to his mind but he timidly possessed himself of a sandwich hope you're not going to scorn my deviled egg said his goddess i am very proud of it he did not he scorned little that was on the plate their gentle intimacy was ineffable to the boy he thought he had a friend a beautiful lady who liked him more than she did anybody at the picnic to say the least this was proved by the fact that she had flung aside the luxuries of the spread cloth to sit with him the exile thus early did he fall a victim to woman's wiles where do you live he asked suddenly oh a long way from here in new york his next question was put very bluntly are you married oh no she answered gravely jimmy was silent for a time during which he glanced shyly and furtively up at her face it was evident that he was somewhat embarrassed finally he said when i grow up to be a man oh that is some time yet said the beautiful lady but when i do i i should like to marry you well i will remember it she answered but don't talk of it now because it's such a long time and i wouldn't wish you to consider yourself bound she smiled at him he began to brag when i grow up to be a man i'm going to have lots and lots of money and i'm going to have a great big house and a horse and a shotgun and lots and lots of books about elephants and tigers and lots and lots of ice cream and pie and caramels as before she was impressed he could see it and i'm going to have lots and lots of children about three hundred i guess and there won't none of them be girls they'll all be boys like me 
oh my she said his garment of shame was gone from him the pail was dead and well buried it seemed to him that months elapsed as he dwelt in happiness near the beautiful lady and trumpeted his vanity at last there was a shout come on we're going home the picnickers trooped out of the grove the children wished to resume their jeering for jimmy still gripped his pail but they were restrained by the circumstances he was walking at the side of a beautiful lady during his journey he abandoned many of his habits for instance he never travelled without skipping gracefully from crack to crack between the stones or without pretending that he was a train of cars or without some mumming device of childhood but now he behaved with dignity he made no more noise than a little mouse he escorted the beautiful lady to the gate of the earl home where he awkwardly solemnly and wistfully shook hands in good-bye he watched her go up the walk the door clanged on his way home he dreamed one of these dreams was fascinating supposing the beautiful lady was his teacher in school oh my wouldn't he be a good boy sitting like a statuette all day long and knowing every lesson to perfection and everything and then supposing that a boy should sass her jimmy painted himself waylaying that boy on the homeward road and the fate of the boy was a thing to make strong men cover their eyes with their hands and she would like him more and more more and more and he he would be a little god but as he was entering his father's grounds an appalling recollection came to him he was returning with the bread and butter and the salmon untouched in the pail he could imagine the cook nine feet tall waving her fist and so that's what i took trouble for is it so's you could bring it back so's you can bring it back he skulked towards the house like a marauding bushranger when he neared the kitchen door he made a desperate rush past it aiming to gain the stables and there secrete his guilt he was nearing them when a thunderous voice hailed him from the rear jimmy trescott where are you going with that pail it was the cook he made no reply but plunged into the shelter of the stables he whirled the lid from the pail and dashed its contents beneath a heap of blankets then he stood panting his eyes on the door the cook did not pursue but she was bawling jimmy trescott what you doing with that pail he came forth swinging it nothing he said in virtuous protest i know better she said sharply as she relieved him of his curse in the morning jimmy was playing near the stable when he heard a shout from peter washington who attended dr trescott's horse jim oh jim what come here jimmy went reluctantly to the door of the stable and peter washington asked what's dis here fish and bread doing under these here blankets i don't know i didn't have nothing to do with it answered jimmy indignantly don't tell me cried peter washington as he flung it all away don't tell me when i find fish and brain under these here blankets i don't go and think this here horses or your pops put em i know and if i catch Section 7 of Willemville Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Willemville Stories by Stephen Crane. The Carriage Lamps. It was the fault of a small nickel plated revolver, a most incompetent weapon which, wherever one aimed, would fling the bullet as the devil willed, and no man, when about to use it, could tell exactly what was in store for the surrounding country. This treasure had been acquired by Jimmy Trescott after arduous bargaining with another small boy. Jimmy wended homeward, patting his hip pocket at every three paces. Peter Washington, working in the carriage house, looked out upon him with a shrewd eye. "'Oh, Jim!' he called. "'What you got in your hand pocket?' "'Nothing,' 
said Jimmy, feeling carefully under his jacket to make sure that the revolver wouldn't fall out. Peter chuckled. Some more foolishness, I reckon. You gwine be hung one day, Jim. You keep up all dish year nonsense. Jimmy made no reply, but went into the back garden, where he hid the revolver in a box under a lilac bush. Then he returned to the vicinity of Peter, and began to cruise to and fro in the offing, showing all the signals of one wishing to open treaty. Pete, he said, how much does a box of cartridges cost? Peter raised himself violently, holding in one hand a piece of harness and in the other an old rag. Cartridges! Cartridges! Land's sake! What the kid want with cartridges? Knew it! Knew it! Come home or holding on to his hand pocket like he got money in it, and now he want cartridges! Jimmy, after viewing with dismay the excitement caused by his question, began to move warily out of the reach of a possible hostile movement. Cartridges! continued Peter, in scorn and horror. Kid like you, no bigger in a minute. Look y'all, Jim, you done been swapping round, and you done got hold of a pistol. The charge was dramatic. The wind was almost knocked out of Jimmy by this display of Peter's terrible miraculous power, and as he backed away his feeble denials were more convincing than a confession. I'll tell your pop cried Peter, in virtuous grandeur. I'll tell your pop. In the distance Jimmy stood appalled. He knew not what to do. The dread adult wisdom of Peter Washington had laid bare the sin and disgrace stared at Jimmy. There was a whirl of wheels, and a high, lean-trotting mare spun Dr. Trescott's buggy towards Peter, who ran forward busily. As the doctor climbed out, Peter, holding the mare's head, began his denunciation. Doctor, I gwin tell on Jim. He come home a holdin' on to his hind pocket and proud like he won a tucker raffle, and I sure know what he been up to, and I done challenge him, and he never say he didn't. Why, what do you mean? said the doctor. What's this, Jimmy? The boy came forward, glaring wrathfully at Peter. In fact, he suddenly was so filled with rage at Peter that he forgot all precautions. "'It's about a pistol,' he said bluntly. "'I've got a pistol. I swapped for it.' "'I done told him his pop wouldn't stand no firearms, and him a kid like he is. I done told him, land's sake, he strut like he was a soldier. Come in yer proud and are holding on to his hind pocket. He think it was Jesse James, I reckon.' But I done told him his pop stand no such foolishness. First thing, blam, he shoot his head off. No, sir, he too tiny to come in here strutting like he just bought Main Street. I told him I done told him shop. I don't want to be loafing around this year stable. If Jim, he gwine go shooting round and shooting round. Bim, blam, bam. No, sir, I retires, I retires. It's all right if a grown man got her gun, but ain't no kids come foolishin' round me with firearms. No, sir, I retires. Oh, be quiet, Peter, said the doctor. Where is this thing, Jimmy? The boy went sulkily to the box under the lilac bush and returned with the revolver. Here tis, he said with a glare over his shoulder at Peter. The doctor looked at the silly weapon in critical contempt. It's not much of a thing, Jimmy, but I don't think you're quite old enough for it yet. I'll keep it for you in one of the drawers of my desk. Peter Washington burst out proudly. I done told him the doctor wouldn't stand no trafficking round yeah with firearms. I done told him. Jimmy and his father went together into the house, and as Peter unharnessed the mare, he continued his comments on the boy and the revolver. He was not cast down by the absence of hearers. In fact, he usually talked better when there was no one to listen save the horses. But now his observations bore small resemblance to his earlier and public statements. 
admiration and the keen family pride of a southern negro who has been long in one place were now in his tone that boy he's a devil when he get to be her man wow he'll just take and make things whirl round yer reckon we'll all take her back seat when he comes along a raisin cane he had unharnessed the mare, and with his back bent was pushing the buggy into the carriage-house. A pistol! And him no bigger than a minute! A small stone whizzed past Peter's head and clattered on the stable. He hastily dropped all occupation and struck a curious attitude. His right knee was almost up to his chin, and his arms were wreathed protectingly about his head. He had not looked in the direction from which the stone had come, but he had begun immediately to yell. "'You, Jim, quit! Quit, I tell you! Jim, watch out! You go on break something, Jim!' "'Yah!' taunted the boy, as with the speed and ease of a light cavalryman he maneuvered in the distance. "'Yah! Told on me, did you? Told on me, eh? There, how do you like that?' The missiles resounded against the stable. "'Watch out, Jim! You go on break something!' "'Jim, I tell you, quit your foolishness. "'Jim, ow! Watch out, boy! I—' "'There was a crash. "'With diabolical ingenuity, "'one of Jimmy's pebbles had entered the carriage-house "'and had landed among a row of carriage-lamps on a shelf, "'creating havoc which was apparently beyond all reason of physical law. "'It seemed to Jimmy that the racket of falling glass "'could have been heard in an adjacent county.' Peter was a prophet who, after persecution, was suffered to recall everything to the mind of the persecutor. There! Knew it! Knew it! Now I reckon you'll quit. Hi! Just look at these yer lamps! For land's sake! Oh, now your pop just break every bone in your body! In the doorway of the kitchen, the cook appeared with a startled face. Jimmy's father and mother came suddenly out on the front veranda. "'What was that noise?' called the doctor. Peter went forward to explain. "'Jimmy was a even rocks at me, doctor, "'and her long come one rock and go blam into all the lamps "'and just skitter em to bits, I declare.' "'Jimmy, half blinded with emotion, "'was nevertheless aware of a lightning glance from his father, "'a glance which cowed and frightened him to the ends of his toes.' He heard the steady but deadly tones of his father in a fury. "'Go into the house and wait until I come.' Bowed in anguish, the boy moved across the lawn and up the steps. His mother was standing on the veranda, still gazing towards the stable. He loitered in the faint hope that she might take some small pity on his state. But she could have heeded him no less if he had been invisible. He entered the house." When the doctor returned from his investigation of the harm done by Jimmy's hand, Mrs. Trescott looked at him anxiously, for she knew that he was concealing some volcanic impulses. "'Well?' she asked. "'It isn't the lamps,' he said at first. He seated himself on the rail. "'I don't know what we are going to do with that boy. It isn't so much the lamps as it is the other thing.' He was throwing stones at Peter, because Peter told me about the revolver. What are we going to do with him? I'm sure I don't know, replied the mother. We've tried almost everything. Of course, much of it's pure animal spirits. Jimmy is not naturally vicious. Oh, I know, interrupted the doctor impatiently. Do you suppose, when the stones were singing about Peter's ears, he cared whether they were flung by a boy who was naturally vicious, or a boy who was not? The question might interest him afterward, but at the time he was mainly occupied in dodging these effects of pure animal spirits. Don't be too hard on the boy, Ned. There's lots of time yet. He's so young yet, and I believe he gets most of his naughtiness from that wretched Dalzel boy. That Dalzel boy, well, he's simply awful. Then, with true motherly instinct to shift blame from her own boy's shoulders, she proceeded to sketch the character of the Dalzel boy in lines that would have made that talented young vagabond stare. 
it was not admittedly her feeling that the doctor's attention should be diverted from the main issue and his indignation divided among the camps but presently the doctor felt himself burn with wrath for the dalzel boy why don't you keep jimmy away from him he demanded Jimmy has no business consorting with abandoned little predestined jailbirds like him. If I catch him on the place, I'll box his ears. It is simply impossible unless we kept Jimmy shut up all the time, said Mrs. Trescott. I can't watch him every minute of the day, and the moment my back is turned, he's off. I should think those dalzel people would hire somebody to bring up their child for them, said the doctor. They don't seem to know how to do it themselves. Presently you would have thought from the talk that one Willie Dalzel had been throwing stones at Peter Washington, because Peter Washington had told Dr. Trescott that Willie Dalzel had come into possession of a revolver. In the meantime, Jimmy had gone into the house to await the coming of his father. He was in a rebellious mood. He had not intended to destroy the carriage lamps. He had been merely hurling stones at a creature whose perfidy deserved such action, and the hitting of the lamps had been merely another move of the great conspirator fate to force one Jimmy Trescott into dark and troublous ways. The boy was beginning to find the world a bitter place. He couldn't win appreciation for a single virtue. He could only achieve quick, rigorous punishment for his misdemeanors. Everything was an enemy. Now there were those silly old lamps. What were they doing up on that shelf, anyhow? It would have been just as easy for them at the time to have been in some other place. But no, there they had been, like the crowd that is passing under the wall when the mason for the first time in twenty years lets fall a brick. Furthermore, the flight of that stone had been perfectly unreasonable. It had been a sort of freak in physical law. Jimmy understood that he might have thrown stones from the same fatal spot for an hour without hurting a single lamp. He was a victim, that was it. Fate had conspired with the detail of his environment to simply hound him into a grave or into a cell. But who would understand? Who would understand? and here the boy turned his mental glance in every direction and found nothing but what was to him the black of cruel ignorance. Very well, some day they would... From somewhere out in the street he heard a peculiar whistle of two notes. It was the common signal of the boys in the neighborhood, and judging from the direction of the sound, it was apparently intended to summon him. He moved immediately to one of the windows of the sitting-room. It opened upon a part of the grounds remote from the stables and cut off from the veranda by a wing. He perceived Willie Dalzel loitering in the street. Jimmy whistled the signal after having pushed up the window sash some inches. He saw the Dalzel boy turn and regard him, and then call several other boys. They stood in a group and gestured. These gestures plainly said, "'Come out. We've got something on hand.' Jimmy sadly shook his head. But they did not go away. They held a long consultation. Presently Jimmy saw the intrepid Dalzel boy climb the fence and begin to creep among the shrubbery, in elaborate imitation of an Indian scout. In time he arrived under Jimmy's window and raised his face to whisper, "'Come on out. We're going on a bear hunt.' "'A bear hunt!' Of course, Jimmy knew that it would not be a real bear hunt, but would be a sort of carouse of pretension and big talking and preposterous lying and valor, wherein each boy would strive to have himself called Kit Carson by the others. He was profoundly affected. However, the parental word was upon him, and he could not move. No, he answered, I can't. I've got to stay in. Are you a prisoner? demanded the Dalzel boy eagerly. Not yes, I suppose I am. The other lad became much excited, but he did not lose his wariness. Don't you want to be rescued? Well, no, I, I don't know, 
replied Jimmy dubiously. Willie Dalzel was indignant. Why, of course you want to be rescued. We'll rescue you. I'll go and get my men. And thinking this a good sentence, he repeated pompously, I'll go and get my men. He began to crawl away, but when he was distant some ten paces, he turned to say, Keep up a stout heart. Remember that you have friends who will be faithful unto death. The time is not now far off when you will again view the blessed sunlight. The poetry of these remarks filled Jimmy with ecstasy, and he watched eagerly for the coming of the friends who would be faithful unto death. They delayed some time, for the reason that Willie Dalzel was making a speech. Now, men, he said, our comrade is a prisoner in yon, in yon, in that there fortress. We must to the rescue. Who volunteers to go with me? He fixed them with a stern eye. There was a silence, and then one of the smaller boys remarked, If Doc Trescott catches us tracking over his lawn... Willie Dalzel pounced upon the speaker and took him by the throat. The two presented a sort of burlesque of the wood cut on the cover of a dime novel, which Willie had just been reading, The Red Captain, a tale of the pirates of the Spanish Main. "'You are a coward,' said Willie, through his clenched teeth. "'No, I ain't, Willie,' piped the other as best he could. "'I say you are,' cried the great chieftain indignantly. "'Don't tell me I'm a liar.' He relinquished his hold upon the coward and resumed his speech. "'You know me, men. Many of you have been my followers for long years. You saw me slay six-handed Dick with my own hand. You know I never falter. Our comrade is a prisoner in the cruel hands of our enemies. Ah, oh, Pete Washington, he dasn't. My pa says if Pete ever troubles me, he'll brain him. Come on, to the rescue. Who will go with me to the rescue? Oh, come on, what are you afraid of? It was another instance of the power of eloquence upon the human mind. There was only one boy who was not thrilled by this oration, and he was a boy whose favorite reading had been of the road agents and gunfighters of the Great West, and he thought the whole thing should be conducted in the Deadwood Dick manner. This talk of a comrade was silly. Pard was the proper word. He resolved that he would make a show of being a pirate, and keep secret the fact that he really was Hold Up Harry, the terror of the Sierras. But the others were knit close in piratical bonds. One by one they climbed the fence at a point hidden from the house by tall shrubs. With many a low-breathed caution they went upon their perilous adventure. Jimmy was grown tired of waiting for his friends who would be faithful unto death. Finally he decided he would rescue himself. It would be a gross breach of rule, but he couldn't sit there all the rest of the day waiting for his faithful unto death friends. The window was only five feet from the ground. He softly raised the sash and threw one leg over the sill. But at the same time he perceived his friends snaking among the bushes. He withdrew his leg and waited, seeing that he was now to be rescued in an orthodox way. The brave pirates came nearer and nearer. Jimmy heard a noise of a closing door, and, turning, he saw his father in the room, looking at him and the open window in angry surprise. Boys never faint, but Jimmy probably came as near to it as may the average boy. "'What's all this?' asked the doctor, staring. Involuntarily, Jimmy glanced over his shoulder through the window. His father saw the creeping figures. "'What are those boys doing?' he said sharply, and he knit his brows. "'Nothing.' "'Nothing. Don't tell me that. Are they coming here to the window?' E "'Yes, sir.' "'What for?' "'To, to see me.' "'What about?' "'About—' "'About nothing.' "'What about?' Jimmy knew that he could conceal nothing. He said, "'They're coming to—to—to 
to rescue me, he began to whimper. The doctor sat down heavily. What? To rescue you? he gasped. Y yes sir. The doctor's eyes began to twinkle. Very well, he said presently. I will sit here and observe this rescue, and on no account do you warn them that I am here, understand? Of course Jimmy understood. He had been mad to warn his friends, but his father's mere presence had frightened him from doing it. He stood trembling at the window, while the doctor stretched in an easy chair near at hand. They waited. The doctor could tell by his son's increasing agitation that the great moment was near. Suddenly he heard Willie Dalzell's voice hiss out a word, Silence! Then the same voice addressed Jimmy at the window. Good cheer, my comrade. The time is now at hand. I have come. Never did the red captain turn his back on a friend. One minute more and you will be free. Once aboard my gallant craft, and you can bid defiance to your haughty enemies. Why don't you hurry up? What are you standing there looking like a cow for? Ah, uh, er, now, you, stammered Jimmy. Here, hold up Harry, the terror of the Sierras, evidently concluded that Willie Dalzell had had enough of the premier part. So he said, Brace up, pard. Don't you turn white-livered now, for you know that hold up Harry. The terror of the Sarahs ain't the man ter— Oh, stop it, said Willie Dalzell. He won't understand that, you know. He's a pirate. Now, Jimmy, come on. Be of light heart, my comrade. Soon you— I'll low arter all this year long time in jail. You thought you had no friends, mebby. "'But I tell ye, hold up, Harry, the terror of the Sarahs. "'A boat is waitin'. "'I have ready a trusty hoss.' "'Willie Dalzell could endure his rival no longer. "'Look here, Henry, you're spoiling the whole thing. "'We're all pirates, don't you see? "'And you're a pirate, too. "'I ain't a pirate. "'I'm hold up, Harry, the terror of the Sarahs.' "'You ain't, I say,' said Willie, in despair. "'You're spoiling everything you are. "'All right, now, you wait. "'I'll fix you for this, see if I don't. "'Oh, come on, Jimmy. "'A boat awaits us at the foot of the rocks. "'In one short hour you'll be free forever from your ex exuable enemies "'and their vile plots. "'Hasten, for the dawn approaches.' The suffering Jimmy looked at his father and was surprised at what he saw. The doctor was doubled up like a man with the colic. He was breathing heavily. The boy turned again to his friends. "'Ah, uh, now, look here,' he began, stumbling among the words. "'You, I, I, I don't think I'll be rescued today.' The pirates were scandalized. "'What?' they whispered angrily. "'Ain't you going to be rescued?' "'Well, all right for you, Jimmy Trescott. "'That's a nice way to act, that is.' "'Their upturned eyes glowered at Jimmy. "'Suddenly Dr. Trescott appeared at the window with Jimmy. "'Oh, go home, boys,' he gasped. "'But they did not hear him. "'Upon the instant they had whirled and scampered away like deer. "'The first lad to reach the fence was the Red Captain. "'But hold up Harry, the terror of the Sierras,' was so close that there was little to choose between them. Dr. Trescott lowered the window and then spoke to his son in his usual quiet way. Jimmy, I wish you would go and tell Peter to have the buggy ready at seven o'clock. Yes, sir, said Jimmy, and he swaggered out to the stables. Pete, father wants the buggy ready at seven o'clock. Peter paid no heed to this order but with the tender sympathy of a true friend, he inquired, Hut? Hurt? Did what hurt? You're trouncing. Trouncing? said Jimmy contemptuously. I didn't get any trouncing. No, said Peter. He gave Jimmy a quick, shrewd glance and saw that he was telling the truth. He began to mutter and mumble over his work. Ump! Ump! These yer white folks act like the thinker boys made her glass. 
no trouncing ump he was consumed with curiosity to learn why jimmy had not felt a heavy parental hand but he did not care to lower his dignity by asking questions about it at last however he reached the limits of his endurance and in a voice pretentiously careless he asked didn't your pop take on like mad about these yer carriage lamps carriage lamps inquired jimmy ump no he didn't say anything about carriage lamps not that i remember maybe he did though let me see mm. Section 8 of Willemville Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Willemville Stories by Stephen Crane. The Knife. Part 1. Cy Bryant's place was on the shore of the lake, and his garden patch, shielded from the north by a bold little promontory and a higher ridge inland, was accounted the most successful and surprising in all Willemville Township. One afternoon Cy was working in the garden patch when Dr. Trescott's man, Peter Washington, came trudging slowly along the road, observing nature. He scanned the white man's fine agricultural results. "'Take your eye off them there melons, you rascal,' said Cy placidly. The negro's face widened in a grin of delight. "'Well, Mr. Bryant, I reckon I ain't only make myself covetous or lookin' at them yer melons, sure enough. They certainly is grand.' "'That's all right,' responded Cy, with affected bitterness of spirit. "'That's all right. Just don't you admire em too much, that's all.' Peter chuckled and chuckled. "'My lord, Mr. Bryant, you, you don't think I'm going to come prowling in dish here garden?' "'No, I know you ain't,' said Cy with solemnity, "'because if you did I'd shoot you so full of holes you couldn't tell yourself from a sponge.' "'Um, no, sir, no, sir, I don't reckon you'll get chance at Pete, Mr. Bryant, no, sir. I'll take and run long and rob her bank for I'll come foolishin' around your garden, Miss Bryant.' Bryant, gnarled and strong as an old tree, leaned on his hoe and laughed a Yankee laugh. His mouth remained tightly closed, but the sinister lines which ran from the sides of his nose to the meetings of his lips developed to form a comic oval, and he emitted a series of grunts while his eyes gleamed merrily and his shoulders shook. Pete, on the contrary, threw back his head and guffawed thunderously. The effete joke in regard to an American negro's fondness for watermelons was still an admirable pleasantry to them, and this was not the first time they had engaged in badinage over it. In fact, this venerable survival had formed between them a friendship of casual roadside quality. Afterwards Peter went on up the road. He continued to chuckle until he was far away. He was going to pay a visit to old Alec Williams a negro who lived with a large family in a hut clinging to the side of a mountain. The scattered colony of negroes which hovered near Willemville was of interesting origin, being the result of some contrabands who had drifted as far north as Willemville during the great Civil War. The descendants of these adventurers were mainly conspicuous for their bewildering number, and the facility which they possessed for adding even to this number. Speaking, for example, of the Jacksons, one couldn't hurl a stone into the hills about Willemville without having it land on the roof of a hut full of Jacksons. The town reaped little in labor from these curious suburbs. There were a few men who came in regularly to work in gardens, to drive teams, to care for horses, and there were a few women who came in to cook or to wash. These latter had usually drunken husbands. In the main the colony loafed in high spirits, and the industrious minority gained no direct honor from their fellows, unless they spent their earnings on raiment, in which case they were naturally treated with distinction. On the whole, the hardships of these people were the wind, the rain, the snow, and any other physical difficulties which they could cultivate. 
About twice a year the lady philanthropists of Willemville went up against them, and came away poorer in goods, but rich in complacence. After one of these attacks the colony would preserve a comic air of rectitude for two days, and then relapse again to the genial irresponsibility of a crew of monkeys. Peter Washington was one of the industrious class who occupied a position of distinction, for he surely spent his money on personal decoration. On occasion he could dress better than the mayor of Willemville himself, or at least in more colors, which was the main thing to the minds of his admirers. His ideal had been the late gallant Henry Johnson, whose conquests in Watermelon Alley, as well as in the hill shanties, had proved him the equal, if not the superior, of any Pullman car porter in the country. Perhaps Peter had too much Virginia laziness and humor in him to be a wholly adequate successor to the fastidious Henry Johnson, but at any rate he admired his memory so attentively as to be openly termed a dude by envious people. On this afternoon he was going to call on old Alec Williams, because Alec's eldest girl was just turned seventeen, and to Peter's mind was a triumph of beauty. He was not wearing his best clothes, because on his last visit Alec's half-breed hound Susie had taken occasion to forcefully extract a quite large and valuable part of the visitor's trousers. When Peter arrived at the end of the rocky field which contained old Alec's shanty, he stooped and provided himself with several large stones. Weighing them carefully in his hand, and finally continuing his journey with three stones of about eight ounces each. When he was near the house, three gaunt hounds, Rover and Carlo and Susie, came sweeping down upon him. His impression was that they were going to climb him as if he were a tree, but at the critical moment they swerved and went growling and snapping around him, their heads low, their eyes malignant. The afternoon caller waited until Susie presented her side to him, then he heaved one of his eight-ounce rocks. When it landed, her hollow ribs gave forth a drum-like sound, and she was knocked sprawling, her legs in the air. The other hounds at once fled in terror, and she followed as soon as she was able, yelping at the top of her lungs. The afternoon caller resumed his march. At the wild expressions of Susie's anguish, old Alec had flung open the door and come hastily into the sunshine. "'Yeah, you, Suze, come along out of dat now. What for you? Oh, how do you do, Mist Washington? How do? How do, Mist Williams? I done found it necessary for to damn near kill dish yer dog o' yourn, Mist Williams. Come in, come in, Mist Washington. Dog no count, Mist Washington. Then he turned to address the unfortunate animal. Hut, did it? Hut. Pears like you gwine done some seance by the time somebody break your back. Pears like I gwine club yer into your frazzle before you find out some seance. Gwan, way from ye. As the old man and his guest entered the shanty, a body of black children spread out in crescent-shaped formation and observed Peter with awe. Fat old Mrs. Williams greeted him turbulently, while the eldest girl Molly lurked in a corner and giggled with finished imbecility, gazing at the visitor with eyes that were shy and bold by turns. She seemed at times absurdly overconfident, at times foolishly afraid, but her giggle consistently endured. It was a giggle on which an irascible but right-minded judge would have ordered her forthwith to be buried alive. Amid a great deal of hospitable gabbling, Peter was conducted to the best chair out of the three that the house contained. Enthroned therein, he made himself charming in talk to the old people, who beamed upon him joyously. As for Molly, he affected to be unaware of her existence. This may have been a method for entrapping the sentimental interest of that young gazelle, or it may be that the giggle had worked upon him. He was absolutely fascinating to the old people. They could talk like rotary snowplows, and he gave them every chance, while his face was illumined with appreciation. They pressed him to stay for supper, and he consented, after a glance at the pot on the stove which was too furtive to be noted. 
During the meal old Alec recounted the high state of Judge Oglethorpe's kitchen garden, which Alec said was due to his unremitting industry and fine intelligence. Alec was a gardener, whenever impending starvation forced him to cease temporarily from being a lily of the field. "'Mr. Bryant, he certainly got a grand garden,' observed Peter. "'Dat so, dat so, Mr. Washington,' assented Alec. "'He got fine garden.' "'Seems like I never did see such melons, big as her barrel, layin' there. I don't reckon anybody in dish year county can hold it with Mr. Bryant when it comes to their melons.' "'Dat so, Mr. Washington.' They did not talk of watermelons until their heads held nothing else, as the phrase goes. But they talked of watermelons until, when Peter started for home that night, over a lonely road, they held a certain dominant position in his mind. Alec had come with him as far as the fence, in order to protect him from possible attack by the mongrels. There they had cheerfully parted, two honest men. The night was dark and heavy with moisture. Peter found it uncomfortable to walk rapidly. He merely loitered on the road. When opposite Cy Bryant's place, he paused and looked over the fence into the garden. He imagined he could see the form of a huge melon lying in dim stateliness not ten yards away. He looked at the Bryant house. Two windows downstairs were lighted. The Bryants kept no dog, old Cy's favorite child having once been bitten by a dog and having since died within that year of pneumonia. Peering over the fence, Peter fancied that if any low-minded night-prowler should happen to note the melon, he would not find it difficult to possess himself of it. This person would merely wait until the lights were out in the house, and the people presumably asleep. Then he would climb the fence, reach the melon in a few strides, sever the stem with his ready knife, and in a trice be back in the road with his prize. There need be no noise, and after all the house was some distance. Selecting a smooth bit of turf, Peter took a seat by the roadside. From time to time he glanced at the lighted window. Part Two When Peter and Alec had said good-bye, the old man turned back in the rocky field and shaped a slow course towards that high dim light, which marked the little window of his shanty. It would be incorrect to say that Alec could think of nothing but watermelons. But it was true that Cy Bryant's watermelon patch occupied a certain conspicuous position in his thoughts. He sighed. He almost wished that he was a conscienceless pickaninny instead of being one of the most ornate, solemn, and look-at-me sinner deacons that ever graced the handle of a collection basket. At this time it made him quite sad to reflect upon his granite integrity. A weaker man might perhaps bow his moral head to the temptation, but for him such a fall was impossible. He was a prince of the church, and if he had been nine princes of the church, he could not have been more proud. In fact, religion was to the old man a sort of personal dignity. And he was on Sundays so obtrusively good that you could see his sanctity through a door. He forced it on you until you would have felt its influence even in a forecastle. It was clear in his mind that he must put watermelon thoughts from him, and after a moment he told himself with much ostentation that he had done so. But it was cooler under the sky than in the shanty, and as he was not sleepy he decided to take a stroll down to Cy Bryant's place and look at the melons from a pinnacle of spotless innocence. Reaching the road he paused to listen. It would not do to let Peter hear him because that graceless rapscallion would probably misunderstand him. But, assuring himself that Peter was well on his way, he set out, walking briskly, until he was within four hundred yards of Bryant's place. Here he went to the side of the road, and walked thereafter on the damp, yielding turf. He made no sound. He did not go on to that point in the main road, which was directly opposite the watermelon patch. He did not wish to have his ascetic contemplation disturbed by some chance wayfarer. He turned off along a short lane, which led to Cy Bryant's barn. Here he reached a place where he could see, over the fence, the faint shapes of the melons. Alec was affected. The house was some distance away, there was no dog, 
and doubtless the Bryants would soon extinguish their lights and go to bed. Then some poor lost lamb of sin might come and scale the fence, reach a melon in a moment, sever the stem with his ready knife, and in a trice be back in the road with his prize. And this poor lost lamb of sin might even be a bishop, but no one would ever know it. Alec singled out with his eye a very large melon, and thought that the lamb would prove his judgment if he took that one. He found a soft place in the grass, and arranged himself comfortably. He watched the lights in the windows. Part Three. It seemed to Peter Washington that the Bryants absolutely consulted their own wishes in regard to the time for retiring. But at last he saw the lighted windows fade briskly from left to right, and after a moment a window on the second floor blazed out against the darkness. Cy was going to bed. In five minutes this window abruptly vanished, and all the world was night. Peter spent the ensuing quarter-hour in no mental debate. His mind was fixed. He was here, and the melon was there. He would have it. But an idea of being caught appalled him. He thought of his position. He was the beau of his community, honored right and left. He pictured the consternation of his friends and the cheers of his enemies if the hands of the redoubtable Cy Bryant should grip him in his shame. He arose, and going to the fence, listened. No sound broke the stillness save the rhythmical, incessant clicking of myriad insects, and the guttural chanting of the frogs in the reeds at the lakeside. Moved by sudden decision, he climbed the fence, and crept silently and swiftly down upon the melon. His open knife was in his hand. There was the melon, cool, fair to see, as pompous in its fatness as the cook in a monastery. Peter put out a hand to steady it while he cut the stem. But at the instant he was aware that a black form had dropped over the fence lining the lane in front of him, and was coming stealthily towards him. In a palsy of terror he dropped flat upon the ground, not having strength enough to run away. The next moment he was looking into the amazed and agonized face of old Alec Williams. There was a moment of loaded silence and then Peter was overcome by a mad inspiration. He suddenly dropped his knife and leaped upon Alec. "'I got gotcha, you!' he hissed. "'I got gotcha, you! I got gotcha. you!' The old man sank down limp as rags. "'I got gotcha, you! I got gotcha. you! Steal Miss Bryant's melums, hey?' Alec, in a low voice, began to beg. "'Oh, Mr. Peter Washington, don't go for to be too hot on de old man. I never come here for steal em. Deed I didn't, Mist Washington. Come yer just for ter feel em. Oh, please, Mist Washington. Come along out of yer, you old rip, said Peter, and don't tremble on dese ere beds. I goin' put you where you won't catch cold. Without difficulty he tumbled the whining Alec over the fence to the roadway, and followed him with sheriff-like expedition. He took him by the scruff. Come along, deacon. I reckon I gwine put you where you can pray, deacon. Come along, deacon. The emphasis and reiteration of his layman's title in the church produced a deadly effect upon Alec. He felt to his marrow the heinous crime into which this treacherous night had betrayed him. As Peter marched his prisoner up the road toward the mouth of the lane, he continued his remarks. Come along, deacon. Nev did see a man so anxious like about a melon patch, deacon. Seems like you just must have seen him growin' and feel him, Deacon. Miss Bryant, he'll be surprised, Deacon, findin' out you come for to feel his melums. Come along, Deacon. Miss Bryant, he expectin' some old rip like you come soon. They had almost reached the lane when Alex Kerr Susie, who had followed her master, approached in the silence which attends dangerous dogs, and seeing indications of what she took to be war, she appended herself swiftly but firmly to the calf of Peter's left leg. The melee was short but spirited. Alec had no wish to have his dog complicate his already serious misfortunes, and went manfully to the defense of his captor. He procured a large stone, and by beating this with both hands down upon the resounding skull of the animal, he induced her to quit her grip. Breathing heavily, 
Peter dropped into the long grass at the roadside. He said nothing. "'Mist Washington,' said Alec at last in a quavering voice, "'I reckon I gone wait year to see what you gone do to me.' Whereupon Peter passed into a spasmodic state, in which he rolled to and fro, and shook. "'Mist Washington, I hope dish year dog ain't gone and give you fitzes.' Peter sat up suddenly. "'No, she ain't,' he answered. "'But she gin me a big skeer. And for your assistance with the cobblestone, Mist Williams, I tell you what I goin' do. I tell you what I goin' do.' He waited an impressive moment. "'I gwine lease you.' Old Alec trembled like a little bush in a wind. "'Mist Washington?' quoth Peter deliberately. "'I gwine lease you.' The old man was filled with a desire to negotiate this statement at once, but he felt the necessity of carrying off the event without an appearance of haste. "'Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Washington. I reckon I ramble home presently.' He waited an interval, and then dubiously said, "'Good evening, Mr. Washington.' "'Good evening, Deacon. Don't come foolin' round feelin' no melums, and I say truth. Good evening, Deacon.' Alec took off his hat and made three profound bows. "'Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.' Peter underwent another severe spasm, but the old man walked off towards his home with a humble and contrite heart. Part Four. The next morning Alec proceeded from his shanty under the complete but customary illusion that he was going to work. He trudged manfully along until he reached the vicinity of Cy Bryant's place. Then, by stages, he relapsed into a slink. He was passing the garden patch under full steam when, at some distance ahead of him, he saw Cy Bryant leaning casually on the garden fence. "'Good morning, Alec.' "'Good morning, Miss Bryant,' answered Alec, with a new deference. He was marching on when he was halted by a word. "'Alec!' He stopped. "'Yes, sir.' "'I found a knife this morning in the road,' drawled Cy. Si and I thought maybe it was yourn." Improved in mind by this divergence from the direct line of attack, Alec stepped up easily to look at the knife. "'No, sir,' he said, scanning it as it lay in Sy's palm, while the cold steel-blue eyes of the white man looked down into his stomach. "'Tain't no knife for mine.' But he knew the knife. He knew it as if it had been his mother and at the same moment a spark flashed through his head, and made wise his understanding. He knew everything. "'Tain't much of a knife, Mr. Bryant,' he said, deprecatingly. "'Tain't much of a knife, I know that,' cried Si in sudden heat. "'But I found it this morning in my watermelon patch, here.' "'Watermelon patch!' yelled Alec, not astounded. "'Yes, in my watermelon patch,' sneered Cy, si, "'and I think you know something about it, too.' "'Me?' cried Alec. "'Me?' "'Yes, you,' said Cy, si, with icy ferocity. "'Yes, you.' He had become convinced that Alec was not in any way guilty. But he was certain that the old man knew the owner of the knife, and so he pressed him at first on criminal lines. "'Alec, you might as well own up now.' You've been meddling with my watermelons. Me? cried Alec again. Yas, my knife. I done carry it for years. Bryant changed his ways. Look here, Alec, he said confidentially. I know you and you know me, and there ain't no use in any more skirmishing. I know that you know whose knife that is. Now whose is it? This challenge was so formidable in character that Alec temporarily quailed and began to stammer. Uh, now, Mr. Bryant, you—you you friend of mine. I know I'm a friend of yours, but, said Bryant inexorably, who owns this knife? Alec gathered unto himself some remnants of dignity, and spoke with reproach. Mr. Bryant, dis yer knife ain't mine. No, said Bryant, it ain't. But you know who it belongs to, and I want you to tell me, quick. "'Well, Miss Bryant,' answered Alec, scratching his wool, "'I won't say as I do know who belongs to dish yer knife, 
and I won't say as I don't. Bryant again laughed his Yankee laugh, but this time there was little humor in it. It was dangerous. Alec, seeing that he had gotten himself into hot water by the fine diplomacy of his last sentence, immediately began to flounder and totally submerge himself. "'No, Mist Bryant,' he repeated. "'I won't say as I do know who belongs to this year knife, and I won't say as I don't.' And he began to parrot this fatal sentence again and again. It seemed wound about his tongue. He could not rid himself of it. Its very power to make trouble for him seemed to originate the mysterious Afric reason for its repetition. "'Is he a very close friend of yourn?' said Bryant softly. "'For friend?' stuttered Alec. He appeared to weigh this question with much care. "'Well, seems like he was her friend, and then again it seems like he—' "'It seems like he wasn't?' asked Bryant. "'Yes, sir.' "'Just so, just so,' cried Alec. "'Sometimes it seems like he wasn't. "'Then again—' "'He stopped for profound meditation. "'The patience of the white man seemed inexhaustible. "'At length his low and oily voice broke the stillness. "'Oh, well, of course, if he's a friend of yourn, Alec. "'You know I wouldn't want to make no trouble for a friend of yourn.' "'Yes, sir,' cried the negro at once. "'He's a friend of mine. "'He is dat. "'Well, then, it seems as if about the only thing to do is for you to tell me his name, so as I can send him his knife, and that's all there is to it.' Alec took off his hat, and in perplexity ran his hand over his wool. He studied the ground, but several times he raised his eyes to take a sly peep at the imperturbable visage of the white man. He, he, "'Yes, Mr. Bryant, I reckon that's about all that can be done.' I going tell you who belongs to dish ere knife. Of course, said the smooth Bryant, it ain't a very nice thing to have to do, but— No, sir, cried Alec brightly. I'm going tell you, Miss Bryant. I'm going tell you about that knife, Miss Bryant. He asked solemnly, does you know who belongs to that knife? No, I— Well, I going tell. I going tell who, Mr. Bryant? The old man drew himself to a stately pose and held forth his arm. "'I gwine tell who, Miss Bryant. Dis your knife belongs to Sam Jackson.' Bryant was startled into indignation. "'Who in hell is Sam Jackson?' he growled. "'He's a nigger,' said Alec impressively. "'And he works in her life. Section 9 of Willemville Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Willemville Stories by Stephen Crane. The Stove. 1. They'll bring her, said Mrs. Trescott dubiously. Her cousin, the painter, the bewildered father of the angel child, had written to say that if they were asked, he and his wife would come to the Trescotts for Christmas holidays. But he had not officially stated that the angel child would form part of the expedition. "'But of course they'll bring her,' said Mrs. Trescott to her husband. The doctor assented. "'Yes, they'll have to bring her. They wouldn't dare leave New York at her mercy.' <sighs> sighed Mrs. Trescott, after a pause. "'The neighbors will be pleased. When they see her, they'll immediately lock up their children for safety.' "'Anyhow,' said Trescott, "'the devastation of the Margate twins was complete. She can't do that particular thing again. I shall be interested to note what form her energy will take this time.' "'Oh, yes, that's it,' cried the wife. "'You'll be interested.' "'You've hit it exactly. "'You'll be interested to know what form her energy will take this time. "'And then, when the real crisis comes, "'you'll put on your hat and walk out of the house "'and leave me to straighten things out. "'This is not a scientific question. "'This is a practical matter.' 
"'Well, as a practical man, I advocate chaining her out in the stable,' answered the doctor. When Jimmy Trescott was told that his old flame was again to appear, he remained calm. In fact, time had so mended his youthful heart that it was a regular apple of oblivion and peace. Her image in his thought was as the track of a bird on deep snow. It was an impression, but it did not concern the depths. However, he did what befitted his state. He went out and bragged in the street. "'My cousin is coming next week from New York.' "'My cousin is coming tomorrow from New York.' "'Girl or boy?' said the populace, bluntly. But when enlightened, they speedily cried, "'Oh, we remember her!' They were charmed, for they thought of her as an outlaw, and they surmised that she could lead them into a very ecstasy of sin. They thought of her as a brave bandit, because they had been whipped for various pranks into which she had led them. When Jimmy made his declaration, they fell into a state of pleased and shuddering expectancy. Mrs. Trescott pronounced her point of view. "'The child is a nice child, if only Caroline had some sense. But she hasn't. And Willis is like a wax figure. I don't see what can be done unless—' "'unless you simply go to Willis and put the whole thing right at him.' "'Then, for purposes of indication, she improvised a speech. "'Look here, Willis. You've got a little daughter, haven't you? "'But confound it, man. She is not the only girl-child ever brought into the sunlight. "'There are a lot of children. Children are an ordinary phenomenon. "'In China they drown girl-babies.' If you wish to submit to this frightful impostor and tyrant, that is all very well. But why, in the name of humanity, do you make us submit to it? Dr. Trescott laughed. I wouldn't dare say it to him. Anyhow, said Mrs. Trescott, determinedly, that is what you should say to him. It wouldn't do the slightest good. It would only make him very angry, and I would lay myself perfectly open to a suggestion that I had better attend to my own affairs with more rigor. Well, I suppose you are right, Mrs. Trescott again said. Why don't you speak to Caroline? asked the doctor humorously. Speak to Caroline? Well, I wouldn't for the world. She'd fly through the roof. She'd snap my head off. Speak to Caroline. You must be mad. One afternoon the doctor went to await his visitors on the platform of the railway station. He was thoughtfully smiling. For some quaint reason he was convinced that he was to be treated to a quick manifestation of little Cora's peculiar and interesting powers, and yet when the train paused at the station there appeared to him only a pretty little girl in a fur-lined hood, and with her nose reddening from the sudden cold, and attended respectfully by her parents. He smiled again, reflecting that he had comically exaggerated the dangers of dear little Cora. It amused his philosophy to note that he had really been perturbed. As the big sleigh sped homeward, there was a sudden shrill outcry from the angel child. Oh, Mama! Mama! They've forgotten my story! "'Hush, dear, hush,' said the mother. "'It's all right.' "'Oh, but, Mama, they've forgotten my stove!' The doctor thrust his chin suddenly out of his top-coat collar. "'Stove,' he said. "'Stove? What stove?' "'Oh, just a toy of the child's,' explained the mother. She's grown so fond of it, she loves it so, that if we didn't take it everywhere with her, she'd suffer dreadfully. So we always bring it. Oh, said the doctor. He pictured a little tin trinket. But when the stove was really unmasked, it turned out to be an affair of cast iron, as big as a portmanteau, and, as the stage people say, practicable. There was some trouble that evening when came the hour of children's bedtime. Little Cora burst into a wild declaration 
that she could not retire for the night unless the stove was carried upstairs and placed at her bedside. While the mother was trying to dissuade the child, the Trescotts held their peace and gazed with awe. The incident closed when the lamb-eyed father gathered the stove in his arms and preceded the angel child to her chamber. In the morning, Trescott was standing with his back to the dining-room fire, awaiting breakfast, when he heard a noise of descending guests. Presently the door opened, and the party entered in regular order. First came the angel child, then the cooing mother, and last the great painter with his arm full of the stove. He deposited it gently in a corner and sighed. Trescott wore a wide grin. "'What are you carting that thing all over the house for?' he said brutally. "'Why don't you put it in some place where she can play with it and leave it there?' The mother rebuked him with a look. "'Well, if it gives her pleasure, Ned,' she expostulated softly, "'if it makes the child happy to have the stove with her, why shouldn't she have it?' "'Just so,' said the doctor with calmness. Jimmy's idea was the roaring fireplace in the cabin of the lone mountaineer. At first he was not able to admire a girl's stove built on well-known domestic lines. He eyed it and thought it was very pretty, but it did not move him immediately. But a certain respect grew to an interest, and he became the angel child's accomplice, and even if he had not had an interest grow upon him, he was certain to have been implicated sooner or later because of the imperious way of little Cora, who made a surf of him in a few swift sentences. Together they carried the stove out into the desolate garden, and squatted it in the snow. Jimmy's snug little muscles had been pitted against the sheer nervous vigor of this little golden-haired girl, and he had not won great honors. When the mind blazed inside the small body, the angel child was pure force— she began to speak. Now, Jim, get some paper. Get some wood little sticks up first. Now we want a match. You got a match? We'll go get a match. Get some more wood. Hurry up now. No, no, I'll light it my own self. You get some more wood. There, isn't that splendid? You get a whole lot of wood and pile it up here by the stove. And now, what'll we cook? We must have something to cook, you know, else it ain't like the real. Potatoes, said Jimmy at once. The day was clear, cold, bright. An icy wind sped from over the waters of the lake. A grown person would hardly have been abroad, save on compulsion of a kind. And yet, when they were called to luncheon, the two little simpletons protested with great cries. Two. The ladies of Willemville were somewhat given to the pagan habit of tea-parties. When a tea-party was to befall a certain house, one could read it in the manner of the prospective hostess, who for some previous days would go about twitching this and twisting that, and dusting here and polishing there. The ordinary habits of the household began then to disagree with her, and her unfortunate husband and children fled to the lengths of their tethers. Then there was a hush. Then there was a tea-party. On the fatal afternoon, a small picked company of latent enemies would meet. There would be a fanfare of affectionate greetings, during which everybody would measure to an inch the importance of what everybody else was wearing. Those who wore old dresses would wish then that they had not come, and those who saw that in the company they were well clad would be pleased or exalted, or filled with the joys of cruelty. Then they had tea, which was a habit and a delight with none of them, their usual beverage being coffee with milk. Usually the party jerked horribly in the beginning, while the hostess strove and pulled and pushed to make it progress smooth. Then suddenly it would be off like the wind, eight, fifteen, or twenty-five tongues clattering with a noise like a cotton mill combined with the noise of a few penny whistles. 
then the hostess had nothing to do but to look glad and see that everybody had enough tea and cake when the door was closed behind the last guest the hostess would usually drop into a chair and say thank heaven they're gone there would be no malice in this expression it simply would be that womanlike she had flung herself headlong at the accomplishment of a pleasure which she could not even define and at the end she felt only weariness the value and beauty or oddity of the teacups was another element which entered largely into the spirit of these terrible enterprises the quality of the tea was an element which did not enter at all uniformly it was rather bad but the cups some of the more ambitious people aspired to have cups each of a different pattern possessing in fact the sole similarity that with their odd curves and dips of form they each resembled anything but a teacup others of the more ambitious aspired to a quite severe and godly set which when viewed appalled one with its austere and rigid family resemblances and made one desire to ask the hostess if the teapot was not the father of all the little cups and at the same time protesting gallantly that such a young and charming cream jug surely could not be their mother but of course the serious part is that these collections so differed in style and the obvious amount paid for them that nobody could be happy the poorer ones envied the richer ones feared the poorer ones continually striving to overtake the leaders the leaders always with their heads turned back to hear overtaking footsteps and none of these things here written did they know instead of seeing that they were very stupid they thought they were very fine and they gave and took heart bruises fierce deep heart bruises under the clear impression that of such kind of rubbish was the kingdom of nice people the characteristics of outsiders of course emerged in shreds from these tea parties and it is doubtful if the characteristics of insiders escaped entirely in fact these tea parties were in the large way the result of a conspiracy of certain unenlightened people to make life still more uncomfortable mrs trescott was in the circle of tea fighters largely through a sort of artificial necessity a necessity in short which she had herself created in a spirit of femininity when the painter and his family came for the holidays mrs trescott had for some time been feeling that it was her turn to give a tea party and she was resolved upon it now that she was reinforced by the beautiful wife of the painter whose charms would make all the other women feel badly. And Mrs. Trescott further resolved that the affair should be notable in more than one way. The painter's wife suggested that, as an innovation, they give the people good tea. But Mrs. Trescott shook her head. She was quite sure they would not like it. It was an impressive gathering. A few came to see if they could not find out the faults of the painter's wife and these added to those who would have attended even without that attractive prospect swelled the company to a number quite large for willemville there were the usual preliminary jolts and then suddenly the tea-party was in full swing and looked like an unprecedented success mrs trescott exchanged a glance with the painter's wife they felt proud and superior this tea-party was almost perfection three jimmy and the angel child after being oppressed by innumerable admonitions to behave correctly during the afternoon succeeded in reaching the garden where the stove awaited them they were enjoying themselves grandly when snow began to fall so heavily that it gradually dampened their ardor as well as extinguished the fire in the stove they stood ruefully until the angel child devised the plan of carrying the stove into the stable and there safe from the storm to continue the festivities but they were met at the door of the stable by peter washington what you bout jim now it's snowing so hard 
we thought we'd take the stove into the stable. And have her fire in it? No, sir. Go on, way from here. Go on. Don't allow no such foolish in round ye. No, sir. Well, we ain't going to hurt your old stable, are we? Asked Jimmy, ironically. Dat you ain't, Jim. Not so long as I keep my two eyes right plumb square pine to that old Jim. <laughs> no, sir. Peter began to chuckle in derision. The two vagabonds stood before him while he informed them of their iniquities as well as their absurdities, and further made clear his own masterly grasp of the spirit of their devices. Nothing affects children so much as rhetoric. It may not involve any definite presentation of common sense, but if it is picturesque, they surrender decently to its influence. Peter was by all means a rhetorician, and it was not long before the two children had dismally succumbed to him. They went away. Depositing the stove in the snow, they straightened to look at each other. It did not enter either head to relinquish the idea of continuing the game but the situation seemed invulnerable. The angel child went on a scouting tour. Presently she returned, flying. I know. Let's have it in the cellar. In the cellar. Oh, it'll be lovely. The outer door of the cellar was open, and they proceeded down some steps with their treasure. There was plenty of light. The cellar was high-walled, warm, and dry. They named it an ideal place. Two huge cylindrical furnaces were humming away, one at either end. Overhead, the beams detonated with different emotions which agitated the tea party. Jimmy worked like a stoker, and soon there was a fine bright fire in the stove. The fuel was of small brittle sticks, which did not make a great deal of smoke. "'Now what'll we cook?' cried little Cora. "'What'll we cook, Jim? We must have something to cook, you know.' "'Potatoes?' said Jimmy. But the angel child made a scornful gesture. "'No! I've cooked about a million potatoes, I guess. Potatoes aren't nice any more.' Jimmy's mind was all said and done when the question of potatoes had been passed, and he looked weakly at his companion. "'Haven't you any turnips in your house?' she inquired contemptuously. "'In my house we have turnips.' "'Oh, turnips!' exclaimed Jimmy, immensely relieved to find that the honour of his family was safe. "'Turnips! Oh, bushels and bushels and bushels! Out in the shed!' "'Well, go and get a whole lot!' commanded the angel child. "'Go and get a whole lot! Great big ones! We always have great big ones!' Jimmy went to the shed and kicked gently at a company of turnips, which the frost had amalgamated. He made three journeys to and from the cellar, carrying always the very largest types from his father's store. Four of them filled the oven of little Cora's stove. This fact did not please her, so they placed three rows of turnips on the hot top. Then the angel child, profoundly moved by an inspiration, suddenly cried out, Oh, Jimmy, let's play we're keeping a hotel, and have got to cook for about a thousand people, and those two furnaces will be the ovens, and I'll be the chief cook. No, I want to be the chief cook some of the time, interrupted Jimmy. No, I'll be chief cook my own self. You must be my assistant. Now I'll prepare them, see? And then you put them in the ovens. Get the shovel. We'll play that's the pan. I'll fix em up, and then you put em in the oven. Hold it still now. Jim held the coal shovel while little Cora, with a frown of importance, arranged turnips in rows upon it. She patted each one daintily, and then backed away to view it with her head critically sideways. There, she shouted at last. That'll do, I guess. Put em in the oven. Jimmy marched with his shovel full of turnips to one of the furnaces. The door was already open, and he slid the shovel in upon the red coals. "'Come on!' cried little Cora. "'I've got another batch nearly ready.' "'But what am I going to do with these?' asked Jimmy. 
there ain't only one shovel leave em in there retorted the girl passionately leave em in there and then play you're coming with another pan tain't right to stand there and hold the pan you goose so jimmy expelled all his turnips from his shovel out upon the furnace fire and returned obediently for another batch these are puddings yelled the angel child gleefully dozens and dozens of puddings for the thousand people at our great big hotel four at the first alarm the painter had fled to the doctor's office where he hid his face behind a book and pretended that he did not hear the noise of feminine reveling when the doctor came from a round of calls he too retreated upon the office and the men consoled each other as well as they were able once mrs trescott dashed in to say delightedly that her tea-party was not only the success of the season but it was probably the very nicest tea-party that had ever been held in willemville after vainly beseeching them to return with her she dashed away again her face bright with happiness the doctor and the painter remained for a long time in silence trescott tapping reflectively upon the window-pane finally he turned to the painter and sniffing said what is that willis don't you smell something the painter also sniffed why yes it's like it's like turnips turnips no it can't be well it's very much like it the puzzled doctor opened the door into the hall and at first it appeared that he was going to give back two pieces a result of frizzling turnips which was almost as tangible as mist had blown in upon his face and made him gasp good god willis what can this be he cried whee said the painter it's awful isn't it the doctor made his way hurriedly to his wife but before he could speak with her he had to endure the business of greeting a score of women then he whispered out in the hall there's an awful but at that moment it came to them on the wings of a sudden draught the solemn odor of burning turnips rolled in like a sea fog and it fell upon that dainty perfumed tea party it was almost a personality if some unbidden and extremely odious guest had entered the room the effect would have been much the same the sprightly talk stopped with a jolt and people looked at each other then a few brave and considerate persons made the usual attempts to talk away as if nothing had happened they all looked at their hostess who wore an air of stupefaction the odor of burning turnips grew and grew to trescott it seemed to make a noise he thought he could hear the dull roar of this outrage under some circumstances he might have been able to take the situation from a point of view of comedy but the agony of his wife was too acute and for him too visible she was saying yes we saw the play the last time we were in new york i liked it very much that scene in the second act the gloomy church you know and all that uh, and the organ playing and then when the four singing little girls came in but trescott comprehended that she did not know if she were talking of a play or a parachute he had not been in the room twenty seconds before his brow suddenly flushed with an angry inspiration he left the room hastily leaving behind him an incoherent phrase of apology and charged upon his office where he found the painter somnolent willis he cried sternly come with me it's that damn kid of yours the painter was immediately agitated he always seemed to feel more than anyone else in the world the peculiar ability of his child to create resounding excitement but he seemed always to exhibit the feelings very late he arose hastily and hurried after trescott to the top of the inside cellar stairway trescott motioned him to pause and for an instant they listened hurry up jim cried the busy little cora here's another whole batch of lovely puddings hurry up now and put em in the oven trescott looked at the painter the painter groaned 
then they appeared violently in the middle of the great kitchen of the hotel with a thousand people in it jimmy go upstairs said trescott and then he turned to watch the painter deal with the angel child with some imitation of wrath the painter stalked to his daughter's side and grasped her by the arm. "'Oh, Papa! Papa!' she screamed. "'You're pinching me! You're pinching me! You're pinching me, Papa!' At first the painter had seemed resolved to keep his grip, but suddenly he let go of her arm in a panic. "'I've hurt her!' he said, turning to Trescott. Trescott had swiftly done much towards the obliteration of the hotel kitchen— but he looked up now and spoke after a short period of reflection. "'You've hurt her, have you? Well, hurt her again! Spank her!' he cried enthusiastically. "'Spank her, confound you, man! She needs it! Here's your chance! Spank her and spank her good! Spank her!' The painter naturally wavered over this incendiary proposition, but at last, in one supreme burst of daring, he shut his eyes and again grabbed his precious offspring. The spanking was lamentably the work of a perfect bungler. It couldn't have hurt at all, but the angel child raised to heaven a loud, clear soprano howl that expressed the last word in even medieval anguish. Soon the painter was aghast. Stop it, darling. I didn't mean, I didn't mean to, to hurt you so much, you know. He danced nervously. Trescott sat on a box and devilishly smiled. But the pasture call of suffering motherhood came down to them, and a moment later a splendid apparition appeared on the cellar stairs. She understood the scene at a glance. Willis, what have you been doing? Trescott sat on his box. The painter guiltily moved from foot to foot, and the angel child advanced to her mother with arms outstretched, making a piteous wail of amazed and pained pride that would have moved Peter the Great. Regardless of her frock, the panting mother knelt on the stone floor and took her child to her bosom, and looked then bitterly, scornfully, at the cowering father and husband. The painter, for his part, at once looked reproachfully at Trescott, as if to say, "'There, you see?' Trescott arose and extended his hands in a quiet but magnificent gesture of despair and weariness. He seemed about to say something classic, and quite instinctively they waited. The stillness was deep, and the wait was longer than a moment. "'Well,' he said, Section 10 of Willemville Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Willemville Stories by Stephen Crane. The Trial, Execution, and Burial of Homer Phelps. From time to time, an unwearied pine bough let fall to earth its load of melting snow and the branch swung back, glistening, in the faint wintry sunlight. Down the gulch a brook clattered amid its ice with the sound of a perpetual breaking of glass. All the forest looked drenched and forlorn. The skyline was a ragged enclosure of gray cliffs and hemlocks and pines. If one had been miraculously set down in this gulch, one could have imagined easily that the nearest human habitation was hundreds of miles away if it were not for an old, half-discernible wood-road that led towards the brook. "'Halt! Who's there?' This low and gruff cry suddenly dispelled the stillness which lay upon the lonely gulch, but the hush which followed it seemed even more profound. The hush endured for some seconds, and then the voice of the challenger was again raised, this time with a distinctly querulous note in it. "'Halt! Who's there?' Why don't you answer when I holler? Don't you know you're likely to get shot? A second voice answered, Oh, you knew who I was easy enough. That don't make no difference. 
One of the Margate twins stepped from a thicket and confronted Homer Phelps on the old wood road. The majestic scowl of official wrath was upon the brow of Reeves Margate. A long stick was held in the hollow of his arm as one would hold a rifle, and he strode grimly to the other boy. "'That don't make no difference. You've got to answer when I holler, anyhow. Willie says so.' At the mention of the dread chieftain's name the Phelps boy daunted a trifle, but he still sulkily murmured, "'Well, you knew it was me.' He started on his way through the snow, but the twin sturdily blocked the path. "'You can't pass less than you give the countersign.' "'Huh?' said the Phelps boy. "'Countersign?' "'Yes, countersign,' sneered the twin, strong in his sense of virtue. But the Phelps boy became very angry. "'Can't I, hey? Can't I, hey? I'll show you whether I can or not. I'll show you, Reeves Margate.' There was a short scuffle and then arose the anguished clamor of the sentry. "'Hey, fellers! There's a man trying to run a-past the guard! Hey, fellers! Hey!' There was a great noise in the adjacent underbrush. The voice of Willie could be heard exhorting his followers to charge swiftly and bravely. Then they appeared. Willie Dalzell, Jimmy Trescott, the other Margate twin, and Dan Earl. The chieftain's face was dark with wrath. "'What's the matter?' "'Can't you play it right? Ain't you got any sense?' he asked the Phelps boy. The sentry was yelling out his grievance. "'Now, he came along, and I hollered at him, and he didn't pay no tension, and when I asked him for the countersign, he wouldn't say nothing. That ain't no way.' "'Can't you play it right?' asked the chief again, with gloomy scorn. "'He knew it was me easy enough,' said the Phelps boy. "'That ain't got nothing to do with it,' cried the chief furiously. "'That ain't got nothing to do with it. "'If you're going to play, you've got to play it right. "'It ain't no fun if you go spoiling the whole thing this way. "'Can't you play it right?' "'I forgot the countersign,' lied the culprit weakly. "'Whereupon the remainder of the band yelled out, with one triumphant voice, "'War to the knife! War to the knife! "'I remember it, Willie, don't I, Willie?' "'The leader was puzzled.' Evidently he was trying to develop in his mind a plan for dealing correctly with this unusual incident. He felt, no doubt, that he must proceed according to the books, but unfortunately the books did not cover the point precisely. However, he finally said to Homer Phelps, "'You are under arrest.' Then with a stentorian voice he shouted, "'Seize him!' His loyal followers looked startled for a brief moment, but directly they began to move upon the Phelps boy. The latter clearly did not intend to be seized. He backed away, expostulating wildly. He even seemed somewhat frightened. "'No! No! Don't you touch me, I tell you! Don't you dare touch me!' The others did not seem anxious to engage. They moved slowly, watching the desperate light in his eyes. The chieftain stood with folded arms, his face growing darker and darker with impatience. At length he burst out, "'Oh, seize him, I tell you!' Why don't you seize him? Grab him by the leg, Danny. Hurry up, all of you. Seize him, I keep a saying. Thus adjured, the Margate twins and Dan Earl made another pained effort while Jimmy Trescott maneuvered to cut off a retreat. But to tell the truth, there was a boyish law which held them back from laying hands of violence upon little Phelps under these conditions. Perhaps it was because they were only playing, whereas he was now undeniably serious. At any rate, they looked very sick of their occupation. "'Don't you dare!' snarled the Phelps boy, facing first one and then the other. He was almost in tears. "'Don't you dare touch me!' The chieftain was now hopping with exasperation. "'Oh, seize him, can't you? You're no good at all!' Then he loosed his wrath upon the Phelps boy. "'Stand still, Homer, can't you? You've got to be seized, you know. That ain't the way. It ain't any fun if you keep a-dodging that way. "'Stand still, can't you? You've got to be seized.' "'I don't want to be seized,' retorted the Phelps boy, obstinate and bitter. "'But you've got to be seized,' yelled the maddened chief. "'Don't you see? That's the way to play it.' The Phelps boy answered promptly, "'But I don't want to play that way.' "'But that's the right way to play it, don't you see? You've got to play it the right way. You've got to be seized, and then we'll hold a trial on you, and—' and all sorts of things. 
But this prospect held no illusions for the Phelps boy. He continued doggedly to repeat, I don't want to play that way. Of course, in the end, the chief stooped to beg and beseech this unreasonable lad. Oh, come on, Homer, don't be so mean. You are spoiling everything. We won't hurt you any, not the tiniest bit. It's all just playing. What's the matter with you? The different tone of the leader made an immediate impression upon the other. He showed some signs of the beginning of weakness. Well, he asked, what you going to do? Why, first we're going to put you in a dungeon, or tie you to a stake or something like that. Just pretend, you know, added the chief hurriedly. And then we'll hold a trial, awful solemn. But there won't be anything what'll hurt you, not a thing. And so the game was readjusted. The Phelps boy was marched off between Dan Earl and a Margate twin. The party proceeded to their camp, which was hidden some hundred feet back in the thickets. There was a miserable little hut with a pine-bark roof, which so frankly and constantly leaked that existence in the open air was always preferable. At present it was noisily dripping melted snow into the black, moldy interior. In front of this hut a feeble fire was flickering through its unhappy career. Underfoot the watery snow was of the color of lead. The party having arrived at the camp, the chief leaned against a tree, and balancing on one foot, drew off a rubber boot. From this boot he emptied about a quart of snow. He squeezed his stocking, which had a hole from which protruded a lobster-red toe. He resumed his boot. "'Bring up the prisoner,' said he. They did it. "'Guilty or not guilty?' he asked. "'Huh?' said the Phelps boy. "'Guilty or not guilty?' demanded the chief, peremptorily. "'Guilty or not guilty? Don't you understand?' Homer Phelps looked profoundly puzzled. "'Guilty or not guilty?' he asked, slowly and weakly. The chief made a swift gesture, and turned in despair to the others. "'Oh, he don't do it right. He does it all wrong.' He again faced the prisoner with an air of making a last attempt. "'Now look a here, Homer. When I say guilty or not guilty, you want to up and say, "'Not guilty, don't you see?' "'Not guilty,' said Homer, at once. "'No, no, no. Wait till I ask you. Now wait.' He called out pompously, "'Pards, if this prisoner before us is guilty, what shall be his fate?' All those well-trained little infants, with one voice, sung out, "'Death!' "'Prisoner,' continued the chief, "'are you guilty or not guilty?' "'But look a here,' argued Homer. "'You said it wouldn't be nothing that would hurt. I—' "'Thunder and lightning!' roared the wretched chief. Keep your mouth shut, can't ye? What in the mischief? But there was an interruption from Jimmy Trescott, who shouldered a twin aside and stepped to the front. Here, he said very contemptuously, let me be the prisoner. I'll show him how to do it. All right, Jim, cried the chief, delighted. You be the prisoner, then. Now all you fellers with guns stand there in a row. Get out of the way, Homer. He cleared his throat and addressed Jimmy. Prisoner! Are you guilty or not guilty? Not guilty, answered Jimmy firmly, standing there before his judge, unarmed, slim, quiet, modest. He was ideal. The chief beamed upon him, and looked aside to cast a triumphant and withering glance upon Homer Phelps. He said, There, that's the way to do it. The twins and Dan Earl also much admired Jimmy. That's all right so far, anyhow, said the satisfied chief. And now we'll—now we'll—we'll we'll proceed with the execution. That ain't right, said the new prisoner suddenly. That ain't the next thing. You've got to have a trial first. You've got to fetch up a lot of people first who will say I done it. That's so, said the chief. I didn't think. Here, Reeves, you be the first witness. Did the prisoner do it? The twin gulped for a moment in his anxiety to make the proper reply. He was at the point where the roads forked. Finally he hazarded, Yes. There, said the chief. That's one of them. Now, Dan, you be a witness. Did he do it? Dan Earl, having before him the twins' example, did not hesitate. Yes, he said. Well, then, pards, what shall be his fate? Again came the ringing answer. Death. With Jimmy in the principal role, this drama, hidden deep in the hemlock thicket, neared a kind of perfection. 
"'You must blindfold me,' cried the condemned lad, briskly. "'And then I'll go off and stand, and you must all get in a row and shoot me.' The chief gave this plan his urbane countenance, and the twins and Dan Earl were greatly pleased. They blindfolded Jimmy under his careful directions. He waded a few paces into snow, and then turned and stood with quiet dignity awaiting his fate. The chief marshaled the twins and Dan Earl in line with their sticks. He gave the necessary commands. Load. Ready. Aim. Fire. At the last command the firing party altogether yelled, Bang! Jimmy threw his hands high, tottered in agony for a moment, and then crashed full length into the snow, into, one would think, a serious case of pneumonia. It was beautiful. He arose almost immediately, and came back to them, wondrously pleased with himself. They acclaimed him joyously. The chief was particularly grateful. He was always trying to bring off these little romantic affairs, and it seemed, after all, that the only boy who could ever really help him was Jimmy Trescott. "'There,' he said to the others, "'that's the way it ought to be done.' They were touched to the heart by the whole thing, and they looked at Jimmy with big, smiling eyes. Jimmy, blown out like a balloon-fish with pride of his performance, swaggered to the fire and took seat on some wet hemlock boughs. "'Fetch some more wood, one of you kids,' he murmured negligently. One of the twins came fortunately upon a small cedar tree, the lower branches of which were dead and dry. An armful of these branches flung upon the sick fire soon made a high, ruddy, warm blaze, which was like an illumination in honor of Jimmy's success. The boys sprawled about the fire and talked the regular language of the game. "'Wild pards,' remarked the chief, "'it's many a night we've had together here in the Rockies among the bars and Indians, eh?' "'Yes, pard,' replied Jimmy Trescott. "'I reckon you're right. Our wild free life is—there ain't nothing to compare with our wild free life.' Whereupon the two lads arose and magnificently shook hands, while the others watched them in an ecstasy. "'I'll all stick by you, pard,' said Jimmy earnestly. "'When you're in trouble, don't forget that. Lightning Lou is at your back.' "'Thank ye, pard,' quoth Willie Dalzell, deeply affected. I'll not forget it, pard, and don't you forget, either, that dead-shot demon, the leader of the Red Raiders, never forgets a friend." But Homer Phelps was having none of this great fun. Since his disgraceful refusal to be seized and executed, he had been hovering unheeded on the outskirts of the band. He seemed very sorry. He cast a wistful eye at the romantic scene. He knew too well that if he went near at that particular time he would be certain to encounter a pitiless snubbing, so he vacillated modestly in the background. At last the moment came when he dared venture near enough to the fire to gain some warmth, for he was now bitterly suffering with the cold. He sidled close to Willie Dalzell. No one heeded him. Eventually he looked at his chief, and with a bright face said, "'Now, if I was seized now to be executed, I could do it as well as Jimmy Trescott I could.' The chief gave a crow of scorn, in which he was followed by the other boys. Ho! Oh, he cried. Why didn't you do it, then? Why didn't you do it? Homer Phelps felt upon him many pairs of disdainful eyes. He wagged his shoulders in misery. You're dead, said the chief frankly. That's what you are. We executed you, we did. When? demanded the Phelps boy with some spirit. Just a little while ago. Didn't we, fellers? "'Hey, fellers, didn't we?' The trained chorus cried, "'Yes, of course we did. You're dead, Homer. You can't play any more. You're dead.' "'That wasn't me. It was Jimmy Trescott,' he said in a low and bitter voice, his eyes on the ground. He would have given the world if he could have retracted his mad refusals of the early part of the drama. "'No,' said the chief, "'it was you. We're playing it was you, and it was you. You're dead, you are.' and seeing the cruel effect of his words, he did not refrain from administering some advice. The next time, don't be such a chucklehead. Presently the camp imagined that it was attacked by Indians, and the boys dodged behind trees with their stick rifles, shouting out bang, and encouraging each other to resist until the last. 
In the meantime the dead lad hovered near the fire, looking moodily at the gay and exciting scene. After the fight the gallant defenders returned one by one to the fire, where they grandly clasped hands, calling each other old pard, and boasting of their deeds. Parenthetically, one of the twins had an unfortunate inspiration. "'I killed the Indian chief, fellers. Did you see me kill the Indian chief?' But Willie Dalzell, his own chief, turned upon him wrathfully. "'You didn't kill no chief. I killed him with me own hand.' "'Oh,' said the twin apologetically at once, "'it must have been some other Indian.' "'Who's wounded?' cried Willie Dalzell. "'Ain't anybody wounded?' The party professed themselves well and sound. The roving and inventive eye of the chief chanced upon Homer Phelps. "'Ho! Here's a dead man. Come on, fellers. Here's a dead man. We've got to bury him, you know.' And at his bidding they pounced upon the dead Phelps lad. The unhappy boy saw clearly his road to rehabilitation, but mind and body revolted at the idea of burial even as they had revolted at the thought of execution. "'No,' he said stubbornly. "'No, I don't want to be buried. I don't want to be buried.' "'You've got to be buried,' yelled the chief passionately. "'Tain't going to hurt you, is it? Think you're made of glass? Come on, fellers, get the grave ready.' They scattered hemlock boughs upon the snow in the form of a rectangle, and piled other boughs near at hand. The victim surveyed these preparations with a glassy eye. When all was ready, the chief turned determinedly to him. "'Come on now, Homer. We've got to carry you to the grave. Get him by the legs, Jim.' Little Phelps had now passed into that state which may be described as a curious and temporary childish fatalism. He still objected, but it was only feeble muttering, as if he did not know what he spoke. In some confusion they carried him to the rectangle of hemlock boughs and dropped him. Then they piled other boughs upon him, until he was not to be seen. The chief stepped forward to make a short address, but before proceeding with it he thought it expedient from certain indications to speak to the grave itself. "'Lie still, can't ye? Lie still till I get through.' There was a faint movement of the boughs, and then a perfect silence. The chief took off his hat. Those who watched him could see that his face was harrowed with emotion. Pards, he began brokenly, Pards, we've got one more debt to pay them murderin' redskins. Bowie Knife Joe was a brave man and a good pard. But he's gone now. Gone. He paused for a moment, overcome, and the stillness was only broken by the deep man. Section 11 of Willemville Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. Willemville Stories by Stephen Crane. The Fight. 1. The child life of the neighborhood was sometimes moved in its deeps at the sight of wagon loads of furniture arriving in front of some house which, with closed blinds and barred doors, had been for a time a mystery or even a fear. The boys often expressed this fear by stamping bravely and noisily on the porch of the house, and then suddenly darting away with screams of nervous laughter as if they expected to be pursued by something uncanny. There was a group who held that the cellar of a vacant house was certainly the abode of robbers, smugglers, assassins, mysterious masked men in council about the dim rays of a candle, and possessing skulls, emblematic bloody daggers, and owls. Then, near the first of April, would come along a wagon load of furniture, and children would assemble on the walk by the gate, and make serious examination of everything that passed into the house, and taking no thought whatever of masked men. One day it was announced in the neighborhood that a family was actually moving into the Hannigan house, next door to Dr. Trescott's. 
Jimmy was one of the first to be informed, and by the time some of his friends came dashing up, he was versed in much. "'Any boys?' they demanded eagerly. "'Yes,' said Jimmy proudly. "'One's a little feller, and one's most as big as me. I saw em, I did.' "'Where are they?' asked Willie Dalzel, as if under the circumstances he could not take Jimmy's word, but must have the evidence of his senses. "'Oh, they're in there,' said Jimmy carelessly. It was evident he owned these new boys. Willie Dalzel resented Jimmy's proprietary way. "'Oh!' he cried scornfully. "'Why don't they come out, then? Why don't they come out?' Well, "'How'd I know?' said Jimmy. "'Well,' retorted Willie Dalzel, "'you seem to know so thundering much about em. At that moment a boy came strolling down the gravel walk which led from the front door to the gate. He was about the height and age of Jimmy Trescott, but he was thick through the chest and had fat legs. His face was round and rosy and plump, but his hair was curly black and his brows were naturally darkling, so that he resembled both a pudding and a young bull. He approached slowly the group of older inhabitants, and they had grown profoundly silent. They looked him over, he looked them over. They might have been savages observing the first white man, or white men observing the first savage. The silence held steady. As he neared the gate, the strange boy wandered off to the left in a definite way, which proved his instinct to make a circular voyage when in doubt. The motionless group stared at him. In time this unsmiling scrutiny worked upon him somewhat, and he leaned against the fence and fastidiously examined one shoe. In the end Willie Dalzel authoritatively broke the stillness. "'What's your name?' he said gruffly. "'Johnny Hedge, tis,' answered the new boy. Then came another great silence, while Willemville pondered this intelligence." Again came the voice of authority. "'Where'd you live before?' "'Jersey City.' These two sentences completed the first section of the formal code. The second section concerned itself with the establishment of the newcomer's exact position in the neighborhood. "'I can lick you,' announced Willie Dalzel, and awaited the answer. The hedge boy had stared at Willie Dalzel, but he stared at him again. After a pause, he said, "'I know you kin.' "'Well,' demanded Willie, "'kin he lick you?' And he indicated Jimmy Trescott with a sweep, which announced plainly that Jimmy was the next in prowess. Whereupon the new boy looked at Jimmy respectfully, but carefully, and at length said, "'I don't know.' This was the signal for an outburst of shrill screaming, and everybody pushed Jimmy forward. He knew what he had to say, and as befitted the occasion, he said it fiercely. "'Can you lick me?' The new boy also understood what he had to say, and, despite his unhappy and lonely state, he said it bravely. "'Yes.' "'Well,' retorted Jimmy bluntly, "'come out and do it, then.' "'Just come out and do it!' And those words were greeted with cheers. These little rascals yelled that there should be a fight at once. They were in bliss over the prospect. "'Go on, Jim. Make him come out. He said he could lick you. Ah, oh, he said he could lick you!' There probably never was a fight among this class in Willemville, which was not the result of the goading and guying of two proud lads by a populace of urchins who simply wished to see a show. Willie Dalzel was very busy. He turned first to the one and then to the other. "'You said you could lick em. Well, why don't you come out and do it, then? You said you could lick em, didn't you?' "'Yes,' answered the new boy, dogged and dubious. Willie tried to drag Jimmy by the arm. "'Aw, oh, go on, Jimmy. You ain't afraid, are you?' "'No.' said Jimmy. The two victims opened wide eyes at each other, 
the fence separated them and so it was impossible for them to immediately engage but they seemed to understand that they were ultimately to be sacrificed to the ferocious aspirations of the other boys and each scanned the other to learn something of his spirit they were not angry at all they were merely two little gladiators who were being clamorously told to hurt each other each displayed hesitation and doubt without displaying fear they did not exactly understand what were their feelings and they moodily kicked the ground and made low and sullen answers to willie dalzel who worked like a circus manager ah oh, go on jim what's the matter with you you ain't afraid are you well then say something this sentiment received more cheering from the abandoned little wretches who wished to be entertained and in this cheering there could be heard notes of derision of jimmy trescott the latter had a position to sustain he was well known he often bragged of his willingness and ability to thrash other boys well then here was a boy of his size who said that he could not thrash him what was he going to do about it the crowd made these arguments very clear and repeated them again and again finally jimmy driven to aggression walked close to the fence and said to the new boy the first time i catch you out of your own yard i'll lamb the head off in you this was received with wild plaudits by the willemville urchins but the new boy stepped back from the fence he was awed by jimmy's formidable mien but he managed to get out a semi-defiant sentence maybe you will and maybe you won't said he however his short retreat was taken as a practical victory for jimmy and the boys hooted him bitterly he remained inside the fence swinging one foot and scowling while jimmy was escorted off down the street amid acclamations the new boy turned and walked back towards the house his face gloomy lined deep with discouragement as if he felt that the new environment's antagonism and palpable cruelty were sure to prove too much for him two the mother of johnny hedge was a widow and the chief theory of her life was that her boy should be in school on the greatest possible number of days he himself had no sympathy with this ambition but she detected the truth of his diseases with an unerring eye and he was required to be really ill before he could win the right to disregard the first bell morning and noon the chicken pox and the mumps had given him vacations vacations of misery wherein he nearly died between pain and nursing but bad colds in the head did nothing for him and he was not able to invent a satisfactory hacking cough his mother was not consistently a tartar in most things he swayed her to his will he was allowed to have more jam pickles and pie than most boys she respected his profound loathing of sunday school on summer evenings he could remain out of doors until eight thirty but in this matter of school she was inexorable this single point in her character was of steel the hedges arrived in willemville on a saturday and on the following monday johnny wended his way to school with a note to the principal and his jersey city school books he knew perfectly well that he would be told to buy new and different books but in those days mothers always had an idea that old books would do and they invariably sent boys off to a new school with books that would not meet the selected and unchangeable views of the new administration the old books never would do then the boys brought them home to annoyed mothers and asked for ninety cents or sixty cents or eighty-five cents or some number of cents for another outfit in the garret of every house holding a large family there was a collection of effete school books with mother rebellious because james could not inherit his books from paul who should properly be peter's heir while peter should be a beneficiary under henry's will but the matter of the books was not the measure of johnny hedge's unhappiness this whole business of changing schools was a complete torture alone he had to go among a new people a new tribe and he apprehended his serious time 
there was only two fates for him one meant victory one meant a kind of serfdom in which he would subscribe to every word of some superior boy and support his every word it was not anything like an english system of fagging because boys invariably drifted into the figurative service of other boys whom they devotedly admired and if they were obliged to subscribe to everything it is true that they would have done so freely in any case one means to suggest that johnny hedge had to find his place willie dalzel was a type of the little chieftain and willie was a master but he was not a bully in a special physical sense he did not drag little boys by the ears until they cried nor make them tearfully fetch and carry for him they fetched and carried but it was because of their worship of his prowess and genius and so all through the strata of boy life were chieftains and sub-chieftains and assistant sub-chieftains there was no question of little hedge being towed about by the nose it was as one has said that he had to find his place in a new school and this in itself was a problem which awed his boyish heart he was a stranger cast away upon the moon none knew him understood him felt for him he would be surrounded for this initiative time by a horde of jackal creatures who might turn out in the end to be little boys like himself but this last point his philosophy could not understand in its fullness he came to a white meeting-house sort of place in the squat tower of which a great bell was clanging impressively he passed through an iron gate into a playground worn bare as the bed of a mountain brook by the endless runnings and scufflings of little children there was still a half hour before the final clangor in the squat tower but the playground held a number of frolicsome imps. A loitering boy espied Johnny Hedge, and he howled, "'Oh, oh, here's a new feller, here's a new feller!' He advanced upon the strange arrival. "'What's your name?' he demanded belligerently, like a particularly offensive custom-house officer. "'Johnny Hedge,' responded the newcomer shyly. This name struck the other boy as being very comic. All new names strike boys as being comic. He laughed noisily. Oh, fellas, he says his name is Johnny Hedge. Ha, ha, ha. The new boy felt that his name was the most disgraceful thing which had ever been attached to a human being. Johnny Hedge. Ha, ha. What room you in? said the other lad. I don't know, said Johnny. In the meantime, a small flock of interested vultures had gathered about him. The main thing was his absolute strangeness. He even would have welcomed the sight of his tormentors of Saturday. He had seen them before, at least. These creatures were only so many incomprehensible problems. He diffidently began to make his way towards the main door of the school, and the other boys followed him. They demanded information. Are you through subtraction yet? We study geography. Do you ever? You live here now? You going to school here now? To many questions he made answer as well as the clamor would permit, and at length he reached the main door and went quaking unto his new kings. As befitted them, the rabble stopped at the door. A teacher, strolling along a corridor, found a small boy holding in his hand a note. The boy palpably did not know what to do with the note, but the teacher knew and took it. Thereafter this little boy was in harness. A splendid lady in gorgeous robes gave him a seat at a double desk, at the end of which sat a hoodlum with grimy fingernails, who eyed the inauguration with an extreme and personal curiosity. The other desks were gradually occupied by children, who first were told of the new boy, and then turned upon him a speculative and somewhat derisive eye. The school opened. Little classes went forward to a position in front of the teacher's platform, and tried to explain that they knew something. The new boy was not requisitioned a great deal. 
he was allowed to lie dormant until he became used to the scenes, and until the teacher found, approximately, his mental position. In the meantime, he suffered a shower of stares and whispers and giggles, as if he were a man-ape, whereas he was precisely like other children. From time to time he made funny and pathetic little overtures to other boys, but these overtures could not yet be received. He was not known. He was a foreigner. The village school was like a nation. It was tight. Its amiability or friendship must be won in certain ways. At recess he hovered in the schoolroom around the weak lights of society and around the teacher, in the hope that somebody might be good to him. But none considered him save as some sort of a specimen. The teacher, of course, had a secondary interest in the fact that he was an additional one to a class of sixty-three. At twelve o'clock, when the ordered files of boys and girls marched towards the door, he exhibited, to no eye, the tremblings of a coward in a charge. He exaggerated the lawlessness of the playground and the street. But the reality was hard enough. A shout greeted him. "'Oh, here's the new feller! Here's the new feller!' Small and utterly obscure boys teased him. He had a hard time of it to get to the gate. There never was any actual hurt, but everything was competent to smite the lad with shame. It was a curious, groundless shame, but nevertheless it was shame. He was a newcomer, and he definitely felt the disgrace of the fact. In the street he was seen and recognized by some lads who had formed part of the group of Saturday. They shouted, "'Oh, Jimmy! Jimmy! Here he is! Here's that new feller!' Jimmy Trescott was going virtuously towards his luncheon when he heard these cries behind him. He pretended not to hear, and in this deception he was assisted by the fact that he was engaged at the time in a furious argument with a friend over the relative merits of two Uncle Tom's Cabin companies. It appeared that one company had only two bloodhounds, while the other had ten. On the other hand, the first company had two Topsies and two Uncle Toms, while the second had only one Topsy and one Uncle Tom. But the shouting little boys were hard after him. Finally, they were even pulling at his arms. "'Jimmy! What?' he demanded, turning with a snarl. "'What do you want? Let go my arm!' "'Here he is! Here's the new feller! Here's the new feller! Now!' "'I don't care if he is,' said Jimmy with grand impatience. He tilted his chin. "'I don't care if he is!' Then they reviled him. "'Thought you was going to lick him first time you caught him. Yeah, you're a frayed cat!' They began to sing. "'Frayed cat! Frayed cat! Frayed cat!' He expostulated hotly turning from one to the other, but they would not listen. In the meantime, the hedge-boy slunk on his way, looking with deep anxiety upon this attempt to send Jimmy against him. But Jimmy would have none of the plan. 3. When the children met again on the playground, Jimmy was openly challenged with cowardice. He had made a big threat in the hearing of comrades, and when invited by them to take advantage of an opportunity, he had refused. They had been fairly sure of their amusement, and they were indignant. Jimmy was finally driven to declare that as soon as school was out for the day, he would thrash the hedge boy. When finally the children came rushing out of the iron gate, filled with the delights of freedom, a hundred boys surrounded Jimmy in high spirits, for he had said that he was determined. They waited for the lone lad from Jersey City. When he appeared, Jimmy wasted no time. He walked straight to him and said, "'Did you say you can lick me?' Johnny Hedge was cowed, shrinking, affrighted, and the roars of a hundred boys thundered in his ears. But again he knew what he had to say. "'Yes,' he gasped in anguish. "'Then,' said Jimmy resolutely, You've got to fight. 
There was a joyous clamor by the mob. The beleaguered lad looked this way and that for succor, as Willie Dalzel and other officious youngsters policed an irregular circle in the crowd. He saw Jimmy facing him. There was no help for it. He dropped his books. The old books which would not do. Now it was the fashion among tiny Willemville belligerents to fight much in the manner of little bear cubs. Two boys would rush upon each other, immediately grapple, and, the best boy having probably succeeded in getting the coveted underhold, there would presently be a crash to the earth of the inferior boy, and he would probably be mopped around in the dust or the mud or the snow or whatever the material happened to be until the engagement was over. Whatever havoc was dealt out to him was ordinarily the result of his wild endeavors to throw off his opponent and arise. Both infants wept during the fight, as a common thing, and if they wept very hard, the fight was a harder fight. The result was never very bloody, but the complete dishevelment of both victor and vanquished was extraordinary. As for the spectacle, it more resembled a collision of boys in a fog than it did the manly art of hammering another human being into speechless inability. The fight began when Jimmy made a mad bear-cub rush at the new boy, amid savage cries of encouragement. Willie Dalzel, for instance, almost howled his head off. Very timid boys on the outskirts of the throng felt their hearts leap to their throats. It was a time when certain natures were impressed that only man is vile. But it appeared that bear-cub rushing was no part of the instruction received by boys in Jersey City. Boys in Jersey City were apparently schooled curiously. Upon the onslaught of Jimmy, the stranger had gone wild with rage, boy-like. Some spark had touched his fighting blood and in a moment he was a cornered, desperate, fire-eyed little man. He began to swing his arms, to revolve them so swiftly that one might have considered him a small working model of an extra-fine, patented windmill which was caught in a gale. For a moment this defense surprised Jimmy more than it damaged him, but two moments later a small, knotty fist caught him squarely in the eye, and with a shriek he went down in defeat. He lay on the ground so stunned that he could not even cry. But if he had been able to cry, he would have cried over his prestige, or something, not over his eye. There was a dreadful tumult. The boys cast glances of amazement and terror upon the victor, and thronged upon the beaten Jimmy Trescott. It was a moment of excitement so intense that one cannot say what happened. Never before had Willem Vale seen such a thing, not the little tots. They were aghast, dumbfounded, and they glanced often over their shoulders at the new boy, who stood alone, his clinched fists at his side, his face crimson, his lips still working with the fury of battle. But there was another surprise for Willem Vale. It might have been seen that the little victor was silently debating against an impulse. But the impulse won, for the lone lad from Jersey City suddenly wheeled, sprang like a demon, and struck another boy. A curtain should be drawn before this deed. A knowledge of it is really too much for the heart to bear. The other boy was Willie Dalzel. The lone lad from Jersey City had smitten him full sore. There is little to say of it. It must have been that a feeling worked gradually to the top of the little stranger's wrath that Jimmy Trescott had been a mere tool, that the front and center of his persecutors had been Willie Dalzel, and being rendered temporarily lawless by his fighting blood, he raised his hand and smote for revenge. Willie Dalzel had been in the middle of a vandal's cry which screeched out over the voices of everybody. The new boy's fist cut it in half, so to say. And then arose the howl of an amazed and terrorized walrus. One wishes to draw a second curtain. 
without discussion or inquiry or brief retort woolly dalzel ran away he ran like a hare straight for home this redoubtable chieftain following him at a heavy and slow pace ran the impassioned new boy the scene was long remembered woolly dalzel was no coward he had been panic-stricken into running away from a new thing he ran as a man might run from the sudden appearance of a vampire or a ghoul or a gorilla this was no time for academics. He ran. Jimmy slowly gathered himself and came to his feet. "'Where's Willie?' he said first of all. The crowd sniggered. "'Where's Willie?' said Jimmy again. "'Why, he licked him, too,' answered a boy suddenly. "'He did?' said Jimmy. He sat weakly down on the roadway. He did? After allowing a moment for the fact to sink into him, he looked up at the crowd with his one good eye. And Section 12 of Willemville Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Willemville Stories by Stephen Crane Chapter 12 The City Urchin and the Chaste Villagers After the brief encounters between the Hedge Boy and Jimmy Trescott and the Hedge Boy and Willie Dalzell, the neighborhood which contained the homes of the boys was, as far as child life is concerned, in a state resembling anarchy. This was owing to the signal overthrow and shameful retreat of the boy who had for several years led a certain little clan by the nose. The adherents of the little community did not go necessarily to the boy who could whip all the others, but it certainly could not go to a boy who would run away in a manner that made his shame patent to the whole world. Willie Dalzell found himself in a painful position. This tiny tribe, which had followed him with such unwavering faith, was now largely engaged in whistling and catcalling and hooting. He chased a number of them into the sanctity of their own yards, but from these coins they continued to ridicule him. But it must not be supposed that the fickle tribe went over in a body to the new light. They did nothing of the sort. They occupied themselves with avenging all which they had endured, gladly enough, too, for many months. As for the hedge-boy, he maintained a curious, timid reserve, minding his own business with extreme care, and going to school with that deadly punctuality of which his mother was the genius. Jimmy Trescott suffered no adverse criticism from his fellows. He was entitled to be beaten by a boy who had made Willie Dalzell bellow like a bull-calf and run away. Indeed, he received some honors. He had confronted a very superior boy and received a bang in the eye which for a time was the wonder of the children, and he had not bellowed like a bull-calf. As a matter of fact, he was often invited to tell how it had felt, and this he did with some pride, claiming arrogantly that he had been superior to any particular pain. Early in the episode he and the hedge-boy had patched up a treaty. Living next door to each other, they could not fail to have each other often in sight. One afternoon they wandered together in the strange indefinite diplomacy of boyhood. As they drew close, the new boy suddenly said, "'Napple?' "'Yes,' said Jimmy. And the new boy bestowed upon him an apple. It was one of those green-coated winter apples which lie for many months in safe and dry places and can at any time be brought forth for the persecution of the unwary and inexperienced. An older age would have fled from this apple, but to the unguided youth of Jimmy Trescott it was a thing to be possessed and cherished. Wherefore this apple was the emblem of something more than a truce, despite the fact that it tasted like wet Indian meal. And Jimmy looked at the hedge-boy out of one good eye and one bunged eye. The long-drawn animosities of men have no place in the life of a boy. The boy's mind is flexible. He readjusts his position with an ease which is derived from the fact, simply, that he is not yet a man. But there were other and more important matters. 
Johnny Hedge's exploits had brought him into such prominence among the schoolboys that it was necessary to settle a number of points once and for all. There was the usual number of boys in the school who were popularly known to be champions in their various classes. Among these Johnny Hedge now had to thread his way, every boy taking it upon himself to feel anxious that Johnny's exact position should be soon established. His fame as a fighter had gone forth to the world, but there were other boys who had fame as fighters, and the world was extremely anxious to know where to place the newcomer. Various heroes were urged to attempt this classification. Usually it was not accounted a matter of supreme importance, but in this boy life it was essential. In all cases the heroes were backward enough. It was their followings who agitated the question, and so Johnny Hedge was more or less beset. He maintained his bashfulness. He backed away from altercation. It was plain that to bring matters to a point he must be forced into a quarrel. It was also plain that the proper person for the business was some boy who could whip Willie Dalzell. And these formidable warriors were distinctly averse to undertaking the new contract. It is a kind of a law in boy life that a quiet, decent, peace-loving lad is able to thrash a wide-mouthed talker. And so it had transpired that by a peculiar system of elimination most of the real chiefs were quiet, decent, peace-loving boys and they had no desire to engage in a fight with a boy on the sole grounds that it was not known who could whip. Johnny Hedge attended his affairs, they attended their affairs, and around them waged this discussion of relative merit. Jimmy Trescott took a prominent part in these arguments. He contended that Johnny Hedge could thrash any boy in the world. He was certain of it, and to any one who opposed him he said, you just get one of those smashes in the eye, and then you'll see." In the meantime, there was a grand and impressive silence in the direction of Willie Dalzell. He had gathered remnants of his clan, but the main parts of his sovereignty were scattered to the winds. He was an enemy. Owing to the circumspect behavior of the new boy, the commotions on the school grounds came to nothing. He was often asked, "'Can you lick him?' And he invariably replied, "'I don't know.' This idea of waging battle with the entire world appalled him. A war for complete supremacy of the tribe which had been headed by Willie Dalzell was fought out in the country of the tribe. It came to pass that a certain half-dime blood-and-thunder pamphlet had a great vogue in the tribe at this particular time. This story relates the experience of a lad who began his career as cabin boy on a pirate ship. Throughout the first fifteen chapters he was ropes ended from one end of the ship to the other end, and very often he was felled to the deck by a heavy fist. He lived through enough hardships to have killed a battalion of Turkish soldiers, but in the end he rose upon them. Yes, he rose upon them. Hordes of pirates fell before his intrepid arm, and in the last chapters of the book he is seen jauntily careering on his own hook as one of the most gallous pirate captains that ever sailed the seas. Naturally, when this tale was thoroughly understood by the tribe, they had to dramatize it, although it was a dramatization that would gain no royalties for the author. Now it was plain that the urchin who was cast for the cabin boy's part would lead a life throughout the first fifteen chapters which would attract few actors. Willie Dalzell developed a scheme by which some small lad would play cabin boy during this period of misfortune and abuse and then when the cabin boy came to the part where he slew all his enemies and reached his zenith, that he, Willie Dalzell, should take the part. This fugitive and disconnected rendering of a great play opened in Jimmy Trescott's back garden. The path between the two lines of gooseberry bushes was elected unanimously to be the ship. Then Willie Dalzell insisted that Homer Phelps should be the cabin boy. Homer tried the position for a time, and then elected that he would resign in favor of some other victim. There was no other applicant to succeed him, whereupon it became necessary to press some boy. Jimmy Trescott was a great actor, as is well known, but he steadfastly refused to engage for the part. Ultimately they seized upon little Dan Earl, whose disposition was so milky and docile that he would do whatever anybody asked of him. 
but Dan Earl made the one firm revolt of his life after trying existence as a cabin boy for some ten minutes. Willie Dalzell was in despair. Then he suddenly sighted the little brother of Johnny Hedge, who had come into the garden and in a poor little stranger sort of fashion was looking wistfully at the play. When he was invited to become the cabin boy, he accepted joyfully, thinking that it was his initiation into the tribe. Then they proceeded to give him the rope's end, and to punch him with a realism which was not altogether painless. Directly he began to cry out. They exhorted him not to cry out, not to mind it. But still they continued to hurt him. There was a commotion among the gooseberry bushes. Two branches were swept aside, and Johnny Hedge walked down upon them. Every boy stopped in his tracks. Johnny was boiling with rage. "'Who hurt him?' he said ferociously. "'Did you?' he had looked at Willie Dalzell. Willie Dalzell began to mumble. "'We was only playing. Wasn't nothing for him to cry for.' The new boy had at his command some big phrases, and he used them. "'I am going to whip you within an inch of your life. I am going to tan the hide off in you.' and immediately there was a mixture, an infusion of two boys which looked as if it had been done by a chemist. The other children stood back, stricken with horror, but out of this world they presently perceived the figure of Willie Dalzell, seated upon the chest of the hedge boy. "'Got enough?' asked Willie hoarsely. "'No,' choked out the hedge boy. Then there was another flapping and floundering, and finally another calm. "'Got enough?' asked Willie. "'No.' said the hedge-boy. A sort of war-cloud again puzzled the sight of the observers. Both combatants were breathless, bloodless in their faces, and very weak. "'Got enough?' said Willie. "'No,' said the hedge-boy. The carnage was again renewed. All the spectators were silent but Johnny Hedge's little brother, who shrilly exhorted him to continue the struggle. But it was not plain that the hedge-boy needed any encouragement, for he was crying bitterly and it has been explained that when a boy cried it was a bad time to hope for peace. He had managed to wriggle over upon his hands and knees. But Willie Dalzell was tenaciously gripping him from the back, and it seemed that his strength would spend itself in futility. The bear cub seemed to have the advantage of the working model of the windmill. They heaved, uttered strange words, wept, and the sun looked down upon them with steady, unwinking eye. Peter Washington came out of the stable and observed this tragedy of the back garden. He stood transfixed for a moment, and then ran towards it, shouting, "'Hi! What's all dish here? Hi! Stop her dat! Stop her dat, you two! For land's sake, what's all dish here?' He grabbed the struggling boys and pulled them apart. He was stormy and fine in his indignation. "'For land's sake! You two kids act like you gwine mad dogs! Stop her dat!' The whitened tearful, soiled combatants, their clothing all awry, glared fiercely at each other, as Peter stood between them, lecturing. They made several futile attempts to circumvent him, and again come to battle. As he fended them off with his open hands, he delivered his reproaches at Jimmy. "'I'm surprised at you. Certainly is.' "'Why?' said Jimmy. "'I ain't done nothing. What have I done? You—you—' you, "'You done courage these ere kids to scrap,' said Peter, virtuously. "'Me?' cried Jimmy. "'I ain't had nothing to do with it.' "'I reckon you ain't,' retorted Peter, with heavy sarcasm. "'I reckon you been a prayin', ain't you?' Turning to Willie Dalzell, he said, "'You just take and run along outside this year, "'or I'll just naturally take and damn her kill you.' Willie Dalzell went. To the new boy, Peter said, you look like you had some sayance, but I reckon you don't know no more n a rabbit. You just take and trot along off home, and don't let me catch you round here fightin' or I'll break your back. The hedge boy moved away with dignity, followed by his little brother. The latter, when he had placed a sufficient distance between himself and Peter, played his fingers at his nose and called out, "Nigger, nigger, nigger, nigger." Peter Washington's resentment poured out upon Jimmy. "'Pears like you never would understand. You ain't regular common trash. You take and associate with anybody what done come along.' "'Ah, go on,' retorted Jimmy profanely. "'Go soak your head, Pete.' The remaining boys retired to the street, 
whereupon they perceived Willie Dalzell in the distance. He ran to them. "'I licked him!' he shouted exultantly. "'I licked him, didn't I, now?' From the Willemville point of view he was entitled to a favorable answer. They made it. "'Yes,' they said. "'You did. And afore he knew what it was, I throwed him. And then it was easy.' He puffed out his chest and smiled like an English recruiting sergeant. "'And now,' said he, suddenly facing Jimmy Trescott, "'whose side were you on?' The question was direct and startling. Jimmy gave back two paces. "'He licked you once,' he explained haltingly. "'He never saw the day when he could lick one side of me. I could lick him with my left hand tied behind me. Why, I could lick him when I was asleep. Willie Dalzell was magnificent.' A gate clicked, and Johnny Hedge was seen to be strolling towards them. "'You said,' he remarked coldly, "'you licked me, didn't you?' Willie Dalzell stood his ground. "'Yes,' he said stoutly. "'Well, you're a liar,' said the Hedge boy. "'You're another,' retorted Willie. "'No, I ain't either, but you're a liar.' "'You're another,' retorted Willie. "'Don't you dare tell me I'm a liar, or I'll smack your mouth for you,' said the Hedge boy. "'Well, I did, didn't I?' barked Willie. "'And what you going to do about it?' "'I'm going to lamb you,' said the hedge boy. He approached to attack warily, and the other boys held their breaths. Willie Dalzell winced back a pace. "'Hold on a minute,' he cried, raising his palm. "'I'm not—' But the comic windmill was again in motion, and between gasps from his exertions Johnny Hedge remarked, "'I'll show you whether you can lick me or not.' The first blows did not reach home on Willie, for he backed away with expedition, keeping up his futile cry. "'Hold on a minute!' Soon enough a swinging fist landed on his cheek. It did not knock him down, but it hurt him a little, and frightened him a great deal. He suddenly opened his mouth to an amazing and startling extent, tilted back his head, and howled, while his eyes, glittering with tears, were fixed upon this scowling butcher of a Johnny Hedge. The latter was making slow and vicious circles, evidently intending to renew the massacre. But the spectators really had been desolated and shocked by the terrible thing which had happened to Willie Dalzell. They now cried out, "'No, no, don't hit him any more! Don't hit him any more!' Jimmy Trescott, in a panic of bravery, yelled, "'We'll all jump on you if you do!' The hedge boy paused at bay. He breathed angrily and flashed his glance from lad to lad. They still protested. No, no, don't hit him any more. Don't hit him no more. I'll hammer him until he can't stand up, said Johnny, observing that they all feared him. I'll fix him so he won't know hisself. and if any of you kids bother with me— Suddenly he ceased. He trembled. He collapsed. The hand of one approaching from behind had laid hold upon his ear— and it was the hand of one whom he knew. The other lads heard a loud, iron-filing voice say, "'Caught ye at it again, ye brat ye!' They saw a dreadful woman with gray hair, with a sharp red nose, with bare arms, with spectacles of such magnifying quality that her eyes shone through them like two fierce white moons. She was Johnny Hedge's mother. Still holding Johnny by the ear, she swung out swiftly and dexterously, and succeeded in boxing the ears of two boys before the crowd regained its presence of mind and stampeded. Yes, the war for supremacy was over. Section 13 of Willemville Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Willemville Stories by Stephen Crane Chapter 13 A Little Pilgrimage One November it became clear to childish minds in certain parts of Willemville that the Sunday school of the Presbyterian Church would not have for the children the usual tree on Christmas Eve. The funds free for that ancient festival would be used for the relief of suffering among the victims of the Charleston earthquake. The plan had been born in the generous head of the superintendent of the Sunday school. 
and during one session he had made a strong plea that the children should forego the vain pleasures of a tree and, in glorious application of the golden rule, refuse a local use of the fund, and will that it be sent where dire pain might be alleviated. At the end of a tearfully eloquent speech the question was put fairly to a vote, and the children, in a burst of virtuous abandon, carried the question for Charleston. Many of the teachers had been careful to preserve a finely neutral attitude, but even if they had cautioned the children against being too impetuous, they could not have checked the wild impulses. But this was a long time before Christmas. Very early, boys held important speech together. "'Huh! You ain't going to have no Christmas tree at the Presbyterian Sunday School!' Sullenly the victim answered, "'No, we ain't!' "'Huh!' scoffed the other denomination. We are going to have the all-firedest, biggest tree that you ever saw in the world. The little Presbyterians were greatly downcast. It happened that Jimmy Trescott had regularly attended the Presbyterian Sunday School. The Trescotts were consistently undenominational, but they had sent their lad on Sundays to one of the places where they thought he would receive benefits. However, on one day in December, Jimmy appeared before his father and made a strong spiritual plea to be forthwith attached to the Sunday school of the big progressive church. Dr. Trescott mused this question considerably. "'Well, Jim,' he said, "'why do you conclude that the big progressive Sunday school is better for you than the Presbyterian Sunday school?' "'Now, it's nicer,' answered Jimmy, looking at his father with an anxious eye. "'How do you mean?' Why, now, some of the boys what go to the Presbyterian place, they ain't very nice, explained the flagrant Jimmy. Trescott mused the question considerably once more. In the end he said, Well, you may change, if you wish, this one time, but you must not be changing to and fro. You decide now, and then you must abide by your decision. Yes, sir, said Jimmy brightly. Big progressive. "'All right,' said the father, "'but remember what I've told you.' On the following Sunday morning Jimmy presented himself at the door of the basement of the big progressive church. He was conspicuously washed, notably raimented, prominently polished, and incidentally he was very uncomfortable because of all these virtues. A number of acquaintances greeted him contemptuously. "'Hello, Jimmy. What you doing here? Thought you was a Presbyterian.' Jimmy cast down his eyes and made no reply. He was too cowed by the change. However, Homer Phelps, who was a regular patron of the big progressive Sunday school, suddenly appeared and said, "'Hello, Jim.' Jimmy seized upon him. Homer Phelps was amenable to Trescott laws, tribal if you like, but iron-bound, almost compulsory. "'Hello, Homer,' said Jimmy, and his manner was so good that Homer felt a great thrill in being able to show his superior a new condition of life. "'You ain't never come here afore, have you?' he demanded, with a new arrogance. "'No, I ain't,' said Jimmy. Then they stared at each other and maneuvered. "'You don't know my teacher,' said Homer. "'No, I don't know her,' admitted Jimmy, but in a way which contended modestly that he knew countless other Sunday school teachers. "'Better join our class,' said Homer sagely. "'She wears spectacles. Don't see very well. Sometimes we do almost what we like.' "'All right,' said Jimmy, glad to place himself in the hands of his friends. In due time they entered the Sunday school room, where a man with benevolent whiskers stood on a platform and said, "'We will now sing number thirty-three. Pull for the shore, sailor, pull for the shore.' And as the obedient throng burst into melody, the man on the platform indicated the time with a fat, white, and graceful hand. He was an ideal Sunday school superintendent one who had never felt hunger or thirst or the wound of the challenge of dishonor, a man, indeed, with beautiful flat hands who waved them in a greasy, victorious beneficence over a crowd of children. Jimmy, walking carefully on his toes, followed Homer Phelps. He felt that the kingly superintendent might cry out and blast him to ashes before he could reach a chair. It was a desperate journey, but at last he heard Homer muttering to a young lady, who looked at him through glasses, which greatly magnified her eyes. "'A new boy,' she said, in an oily and deeply religious voice. "'Yes'm,' said Jimmy, trembling. 
The five other boys of the class scanned him keenly and derided his condition. "'We will proceed to the lesson,' said the young lady. Then she cried sternly like a sergeant, "'The seventh chapter of Jeremiah!' There was a swift fluttering of leaflets. Then the name of Jeremiah, a wise man, towered over the feelings of these boys. Homer Phelps was doomed to read the fourth verse. He took a deep breath, he puffed out his lips, he gathered his strength for a great effort. His beginning was childishly explosive. He hurriedly said, "'Trust ye not in lying words, saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these.' Now, said the teacher, Johnny Scanlon, tell us what these words mean. The Scanlon boy shamefacedly muttered that he did not know. The teacher's countenance saddened. Her heart was in her work. She wanted to make a success of this Sunday school class. Perhaps Homer Phelps can tell us, she remarked. Homer gulped. He looked at Jimmy. Through the great room hummed a steady hum. A little circle very near was being told about Daniel in the lion's den. They were deeply moved. At the moment they liked Sunday school. "'Why, now, it means,' said Homer, with a grand pomposity born of a sense of hopeless ignorance, "'it means—why, it means that they were in the wrong place.' "'No,' said the teacher profoundly, "'it means that we should be good, very good indeed. That is what it means. It means that we should love the Lord and be good. Love the Lord and be good. That is what it means.' The little boys suddenly had a sense of black wickedness as their teacher looked austerely upon them. They gazed at her with the wide-open eyes of simplicity. They were stirred again. This thing of being good, this great business of life, apparently it was always successful. They knew from the fairy tales. But it was difficult, wasn't it? It was said to be the most heartbreaking task to be generous, wasn't it? One had to pay the price of one's eyes in order to be pacific, didn't one? As for patience, it was tortured martyrdom to be patient, wasn't it? Sin was simple, wasn't it? But virtue was so difficult that it could only be practiced by heavenly beings, wasn't it? And the angels, the Sunday school superintendent, and the teacher swam in the high visions of the little boys as beings so good that if a boy scratched his shin in the same room, he was a profane and sentenced devil. And, said the teacher, the temple of the Lord, what does that mean? I'll ask the new boy, what does that mean? I don't know, said Jimmy blankly. But here the professional bright boy of the class suddenly awoke to his obligations. Teacher, he cried, it means church, same as this. Exactly, said the teacher, deeply satisfied with this reply. You know your lesson well, Clarence. I am much pleased. The other boys, instead of being envious, looked with admiration upon Clarence, while he adopted an air of being habituated to perform such feats every day of his life. Still, he was not much of a boy. He had the virtue of being able to walk on very high stilts. But when the season of stilts had passed, he possessed no rank save this Sunday-school rank, this clever little Clarence business of knowing the Bible and the lesson better than the other boys. The other boys, sometimes looking at him meditatively, did not actually decide to thrash him as soon as he cleared the portals of the church, but they certainly decided to molest him in such ways as would re-establish their self-respect. Back of the superintendent's chair hung a lithograph of the martyrdom of St. Stephen. Jimmy, feeling stiff and encased in his best clothes, waited for the ordeal to end. A bell pealed. The fat hand of the superintendent had tapped a bell. Slowly the rustling and murmuring dwindled to silence. The benevolent man faced the school. "'I have to announce,' he began, waving his body from side to side, in the conventional bows of his kind, that—' Bang went the bell. "'Give me your attention, please, children. I have to announce—' that the board has decided that this year there will be no Christmas tree, but the— Instantly the room buzzed with the subdued clamor of the children. Jimmy was speechless. He stood morosely during the singing of the closing hymn. He passed out into the street with the others, pushing no more than was required. Speedily the whole idea left him. 
If he remembered Sunday school at all, it was to remember that he did not like it. 